Hey guys, welcome back to Real Housewives Recaps. I'm so glad you're here. You guys, the reactions when I put out these best of compilations have blown me away. They truly have. I I can't believe how long you guys are watching these and really get into them and then comment that they're some of your favorite videos. I just can't tell you how much that means. Having put all the hours of work into these, I just it means so much to me. It truly does. So thank you for watching these. This one I'm excited about. This one is best of, say it with me, revenge. Whether you read the Tom Bauer book or you watch my recaps on it, or you're just here, you know, for the first time, not having read it and wanted to see some highlights, you've come to the right place. It is so interesting rewatching these videos that I did a while ago and going back through, I mean, the awful behavior out of Harry and Megan. This is is specifically some of my favorite part. I mean, <laughs> favorite's not the right word. Uh, some of the most interesting parts of their awfulness while with the royal family. So I'm excited to dive into this. You have over three hours worth of content here, and I truly hope you enjoy it so much. Now, these are just parts of the book that I'm discussing uh, out of, again, the Tom Bauer book, Revenge. So if it seems a little disjointed, it's because I may have cut out like a more boring section to bring you the more interesting stuff, hence the compilation of it all. So I've just cut these videos to to try to make it make sense, but there are parts where it kind of jumps in time a little bit. That's what's going on there. The other thing I want to say is I recorded these a long time ago. Yes, we've learned more information along the way. So you might hear me say something that's, I don't know, outdated and we've learned more sense, or you might even hear me call Catherine, Princess of Wales, Kate or Duchess of Cambridge. That's because when I recorded these, that was her title. So just know that, again, the, they might date themselves a little bit in the way I refer to people, but the sentiment stays the same. It's more the interesting stories that Tom Bauer t tells about them that I'm excited to get into. So without further ado, let's take a look. Thanks so much for being here, everybody. Honk, honk. Hey guys, welcome back to Real Housewives Recaps. Today, we're talking revenge. We are continuing on my deep dive. I am loving this series so much, and today's going to be a good one. We are getting into the engagement. They're already engaged, but we're going to deep dive the bridesmaid dress, the Charlotte of it all, and who made who cry. Come on, we already know who it is, right? <laughs> Megan made Kate cry, and we're going to talk about it because I will not have that on my watch. Get into revenge. So if you remember, old Hazmat and Megan, Hank and Skank, are reflecting on her popularity. Yep, you heard me right. She credits her popularity with being, quote, uniquely special. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Harry is also buying into this fantasy, claiming it's Diana's stardust. Don't even get me started on his continued mommy issues. Ew. Elizabeth Arden cream. Ew. So this is less than a month post-engagement, and Megan was starting to get fearful of her family. Why is that, you ask? Because she's a horrible, horrible person. She didn't want them in the family photographs. She wanted Doria there. Nobody else. Just celebrities. How'd that work out for you? Let's see. December 2017, apparently Tom Jr. sold... Thomas Markle's address to a journalist, according to Tom Bauer. That's a lot of Toms, but you know what I'm talking about. The writer Tom Bauer alleges this, and Markle started to get besieged. He tried to call Megan for help, and old Hazmat apparently got on the horn and threw a tantrum. What else is new? That seems to be the only way this guy can communicate. So he's having his little tantrum saying, don't talk to them. Don't speak to anyone. It's like, okay, dude, he's trying to tell you. Uh, he's being besieged by journalists and all you guys can do is yell at the guy. So Thomas started to note that when Harry was there on the phone, that Megan played sweet and kind. But as soon as Harry left the room, she was a different person. He calls her mean and controlling. Again, sound familiar? <laughs> We've heard this. Although now I feel like the gig is up, right? Like she doesn't even pretend to hide it anymore. She just shows her mean side and he's too stupid to notice. Thomas Markle thinks that Doria was feeding Manger. <laughs> Manger. <laughs> wow, that's good. Megan's anger and spite. So it's Thomas's belief that Doria saw an opportunity that Megan could potentially pay off her debts. Remember, we talked about um, her filing bankruptcy. I believe it was, oh, how much was it? Like 57000 she was in credit card debt, something like that. 
and that Doria knew how to play the game and she was obeying Megan's orders. So basically she was feeding the the devil's horrible personality, right? And doing what she wanted. So they were using each other, it sounds like. Megan got the photo optics and look, a member of my family is here. And then also Doria was using Megan to get her debts paid. Like, sure, I'll play along. I cannot wait for the supplemental part of this book to come out to find out more about Doria and where she was. Mm -hmm. We will deep dive into that when it comes out. Okay, so remember Samantha Cohen? We talked about her. She was uh, picked by the queen to lead the team to help Megan, even though Megan claims there is no team to help her. Poor perpetual victim Megan's <laughs> word was that she was thrown to the wolves. Well, Samantha Cohen's on. Uh, she's speaking up, saying she's just not sure that Megan could ditch Hollywood's hyperbole, and not sure that Megan could understand the royal family's rigid protocols. Well, duh! Look who her tutor. I use quotation marks around that was Harry. That dude's in the corner eating crayons. He has no idea what's going on. All I can think of now, you guys, go with me on a journey. Arrested Development. Buster, anybody? The younger brother <laughs> that was just um, off? <laughs> yeah, that I, I that's what I think of now when I think of Harry. Oh my God, I'm realizing too, Buster also had those insane mommy issues. Remember Mother Boy? Anybody? So <laughs> he had a crush on his mom for whatever reason, too. And so now it seems to be Harry's done the same thing. Ew. Oh, my God. Also, there was lots of talk of seals. Oh, full circle. I, how did I not put this together? Harry is Buster. Okay, so this is the part of the story that gets juicy. Megan is emailing her staff at 5 a.m. So if you remember the reason I bring this up, Harry tried to address this and say, oh, what, my wife was emailing people too early? She's the worst, you know, downplaying it all. And in the book, Tom explains it's not that she was emailing her staff at 5 a.m. She would have a conniption fit if they weren't immediately answered back. Get a life. Biatch. Um, <laughs> it's just, it's wild. We hear a lot about this. Is it Melissa Trubati? She was Megan's assistant and... Um, would often receive the brunt of Megan screaming, including, I wish Tom had gone more into this, but there was uh, mention of an incident where Meg instructed her assistant, Melissa, to buy these special red blankets for a Sanding Sandringham shooting party. Well, it wasn't the right kind of red, so it ended up in a screaming match. I'm, I mean, seriously, not the right kind of red. How, wh what are we doing here? What's happening? All right. So because Tabati had failed to buy the right kind of blanket, basically people are coming forward saying Megan exerted an attitude of entitlement and would often scream at them, literally scream at them. That sounds like a fun place to work, right? So somewhere between Toronto and Kensington, perpetual victim Megan had somehow lost her quote unquote empathy that she loved to speak so much about. Harry's own short-tempered arrogance toward the staff was her model, so of course she thought it was okay. He's acting like an ass, so should she, right? Whoever screams the loudest gets the most attention. Ugh, disgusting. It was at that point that a palace official had to ask Harry and Megan, hey, speak to staff more understandingly. And Megan replied, it's not my job to coddle people. Ugh. Oh. Again, this is what makes me so disgusted. So they're expecting the rest of the world to coddle them. We just read that horrible fiction book spare and how they're the victims of everything. Everybody's mean to everybody. Here's all my grievances. Um, we went through that Netflix series of, oh, they're terrible to me. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> they're terrible to us. But, uh, but again, if asked to speak like a human to another human, then Megan's response is, it's not my job to coddle people. Well, guess what? It's not my job to coddle you two, Hank and Skank. So let's unleash our truth here. Get into chapter 20, aggravation. And Tom goes into how they did this tour showing Megan around the UK. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that was totally smooth behind the scenes. No diva demands there. But Jan Moore from the Daily Mail points out she was acting like she was in a future episode of The Crown. 
So Gina, remember Nell Thorpe Count, had her former publicist, who she'd remained friendly with Megan. Megan was getting weirder and not responding directly to her text, but she thought they were still on good terms. Gina came out for an appearance of Harry and Megan while they were on this tour. She got she talked to palace officials and said, hey, I used to work with Megan. And they're like, okay, cool, here, just wait here in Megan's line. Well, you can imagine a screaming fit happened behind the scenes where Megan said, no, 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 this will not do. I cannot see her. I can't even put my eyes on her. So the palace official came back to Gina and pulled her aside and said, Sorry, we've made a mistake. You can uh, be in Harry's line. So they move her over to Harry's line. And she's like, what? No, I used to work with Megan. Well, Megan didn't want to see her. And Gina went on record to say that Megan only surrounds herself with people who can elevate her. Megan likes to close the door on the past. Again, we've seen this. This sounds very familiar. Okay, so in early 2018, there was a decision to try to make them the Fab Four. They were being introduced as the Fab Four. And... They were doing these things, talking about philanthropic work. Well, they go into this. I remember seeing these pictures and they talk about how Megan got a hold of the mic. (laughs) It's like letting a two-year-old on the mic, right? And decided to give her own little speech and got into platitudes. She started speaking her, quote, virtuous thoughts and talks of ending injustice. Okay, you know where my brain went with this? Go go on a journey with me. So, have, has anybody seen Forgetting Sarah Marshall? I love that movie with Jason Segal, Russell Brand. It's so funny. Russell Brand plays Aldous Snow, and he, <laughs> he, he builds himself up as a philanthropist and writes this meaningless song, We've Got to Do Something. No actual idea of what to do. He just repeats the chorus, we've got to do something. We've got to do something. Before Mother Earth gets any more hurt, we've got to do something. (laughs) Does that sound familiar? It's all platitudes at this point. It's also here where she decided, Megan did, to bring up her protest to the number of scenes in suits that required her to emerge in a towel. What? What are you doing? You're with the future queen and king here. And you're talking about, again, making it about herself. Why am I surprised? And bringing you back to suits. Apparently, according to Harry, William and Catherine were huge fans. I'm surprised their mouths didn't didn't just fly open and they just burst into a round of applause, right? She posed herself as a trailblazer. The fun thing that Tom Bauer brings up is that marriage will make her rich and titled, but it will not make her famous. (laughs) I love that so much. So the discomfort of the four was becoming more obvious. Megan was imagining herself as center stage rather than standing on a periphery. Harry hadn't explained to his future wife that he was a diminishing, he had a diminishing role in the royal family. And Tom Bauer speculates that he probably avoided that truth out of fear of losing Megan. It's so funny, right? How these two just seem to cling on to each other desperate for the other one again how's that working out now i hear things aren't going so well behind the scenes um i will point out that at this event kate's dress cost allegedly 99 pounds and megan 1415 again think about that kate was disappointed in megan's treatment of her shared staff she was getting more reports of this and was trying to put a stop to that. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, they were discussing, well, Charles was discussing his transition when the Queen's reign came to an end. Of course, this is again 2018, I believe. So they were just planning for the future. Charles knew that he needed to strengthen his bond with William. They were working on that behind the scenes and coming up with plans with What would happen when Charles was king? He began to give William and Kate more public duties. So again, I'm sure that made old Maggie Poo super happy about that. And it gave Harry more things to write about and cry on in his journal. And by journal, I mean coloring book, of course. After 21, tears. Okay. So Thomas Markle was getting even more frustrated. He was getting no word from Meghan and Harry. He just wasn't getting his invite to the wedding. Meghan would once in a while throw him something like, hmm, it must have gotten lost in the post. So then 
Thomas found out that Doria was visited by a palace official or a consulate official and was given an official scroll invite to the wedding. Thomas realized Megan was full of you know what. Palace was actually surprised that Megan wasn't going to see her father and encouraged her to do so. Told her you should fly into LA and discreetly be driven down to Mexico, but that would uh, not work out with her plans, right? Sounds like she had big plans to ditch pretty much anybody in her family except for her mother. And how would that work out if that happened? Meanwhile, Megan flew to LA to show her mother sketches of her wedding dress and arranged to have Oscar de la Renta make Doria's outfit. Doesn't this directly contradict what she said before? I mean, everything, but that her passport was taken when she got to the palace, right? Or when she joined the royal... What? That her passport was taken. And yet she was able to travel internationally quite a bit. Hmm, interesting. Nothing makes sense. Family was upset and went on record saying, Megan has climbed socially and left her family behind. Okay, let's get into the juicy stuff. This is the stuff that I find absolutely fascinating. It is known that the royal family does not accept freebies, especially in the way of like fashion designers, that sort of thing. Offers to Kate of free designer goods were rejected on principle. So I was Googling it just to look into it. And sure enough, it says royals do not accept free clothes. So she doesn't... She doesn't take gifted outfits. Middleton stylists will sometimes call on a designer to maybe loan something, but then they would be returned. They're not, they're not to accept the freebies. It would look like they were playing favorites, right, with certain designers. But <laughs> don't you worry. Nothing is too low bar for Hank and Skank. Skank of Hank and Skank decided that it would be a great idea to have her people call up publicity departments for designers and labels such as Chanel, Dior, Armani, Givenchy, etc. And tell them, and this is a quote from Tom Bauer's book, that Megan would be delighted if the house were to bequeath a handbag, shoes, or an accessory to Kensington Palace in the near future. Can you believe the balls on her? My God. Can you imagine how the poor assistant that had to call was probably hiding of embarrassment under her desk? Um, but then they were told these items would be treated as goodwill gifts. So <laughs> the women on the other end at the designer you know, houses were puzzled by the, quote, Duchess discount that Megan was essentially begging for because again offers to Kate were rejected on principle because that is just not something that the royal family does. Don't know why I continue to be surprised but it is so fascinating to me the balls on this woman to act like this to demand these things and then go on to cry about how mistreated she was. Okay so it was around this time that Kate gave birth to baby Louie the th her hers and William's third baby. And Harry at this point became sixth in line. He was no longer the spare. That is a direct quote from Tom Bauer. Apparently Harry did not get this memo because again, that's what he named his book. He relied on partnerships with Megan to help reposition himself. Oof. What is that saying? Hitch yourself to the wrong horse on that one. Around this time that Megan went to inspect St. George's Chapel. I remember hearing about this. Apparently she asked the tour guide about air fresheners in the chapel. And um, yeah, that's no. Mm -mm. Uh, during this time also, Megan frequently had her dress recut. What a nightmare there. Uh, Charles and agreed to increase their wedding budget, jumped on the Google machine to see approximately what the difference was in the weddings, talking about Catherine and William versus Harry and Meghan. So get this, supposedly, allegedly, whatever, around, Harry and Meghan's wedding was expected to cost more than $45 million. That's 32 million pounds. And... Catherine and Williams cost less than uh, ten million less than that. They ex they estimated around thirty five million, which would have been twenty two million pounds. Absolutely unbelievable. 
Harry and Meghan just spending away. And, and it sounds like King Charles was fine. Like, he increased the budget to help. But again, they claim they got no help from anybody. Mm-hmm. Sounds like it. Interesting thing in this part of the book is traditionally, I guess, the wedding guest list would be published. It would go public before the wedding. Well, Megan fiercely protested this. Of course she did. Because then how would it look if her dad's name wasn't on there, right? Like it was pre-planned? Mm-hmm. Also during this time that we got into Tiara Gate. So remember how poorly... Harry spoke of Angela Kelly, the queen's personal advisor, the trusted advisor. Really rude when he talked about her. Well, she had the balls to tell them no on something. How dare she, right? (laughs) So Meghan and Harry were invited to the queen's private dressing room area. Meghan had picked out this emerald tiara. This is the one that Eugenie ended up wearing at her wedding, which I love, by the way. I love Eugenie's dress, too. I just want to say that. That off-the-shoulder dress was really pretty. Um, But I love that she wore it. And remember, as a petty payback, that's whose wedding it was when Harold and Fraud decided to announce their pregnancy. Petty, right? Side note, as we know, Harold and Fraud decided they needed to get married first and that Eugenie's wedding ended up having to get pushed back. So the queen was really kind to Eugenie. And ended up letting her wear the emerald tiara. So I say, suck on that, Megan. I like to think that when Megan saw Eugenie walk down the aisle, she was pissed. But going back, so they were in the queen's private dressing area. Angela was over these tiaras. It was her job. That was one of her tasks is to, you know, keep up with these royal tiaras. And Angela had basically said that the emerald tiara wasn't right for Megan. And she was offered other choices. Well... Harold decided to throw a fit. Apparently, according to the book, he got angry and rude. Angela Kelly ends up telling the queen what went down. And then Harry was summoned to a private meeting and put firmly in his place, according to the Times, who was reporting on this. And I freaking love it. I wish I could have been a fly on that wall when the queen told Harold, stop acting like an ass. Okay, so this hairdresser was flown in for Megan. And so many of you, when I brought up this hairdresser before, had the funniest comments about hairdresser. She had a hairdresser. Her hair looked awful at the wedding. And that's true. I forgot about it. I'm putting a picture up now so you can see it with the tiara. And it just, she looked messy. This hairdresser was flown in and Megan demanded that the tiara be brought to the stylist's room. Well, Angela Kelly is the only one that seemed to respect the queen's property and how things are done and said, no, we don't do that. We don't just drop off the queen's jewels in some random stylist room. That's not a thing. And allegedly, Harry got completely irate. And this is where the what Megan wants, Megan gets uh, comment comes from. And I think I made him too powerful there. I think it was more like what Megan wants, Megan gets hmm. while crossing his arms and pouting like a toddler. Interestingly enough, it was around this time that the staff started calling Harry, quote, the hostage. <laughs> I think that's so good. But now I realize, no, he's just as bad as she is. They're each other's hostages? I'm not sure. But yeah, no, they're both awful. So it's also at this time that we get to Princess Charlotte's dress fitting. Oh, don't even get me started. Okay. So Kate was fed up with Megan. She had heard so many reports of how Megan was treating the staff and Kate was not having it. Catherine was bringing up the royal tradition, such as wearing stockings under your dress, tights, whatever you call them. And Megan was balking at any tradition that Catherine brought up. Also during this time, Jessica Mulroney was there. Her daughter Ivy was also to be a flower girl in the wedding. And... Just funny to me because it sounds like Megan and Jessica were being the wicked witches of the whatever. And and now it's funny because Jessica Mulroney is one of the people that Megan has ghosted. So I don't feel bad about that one, though, because Jessica seems like she sucks. Um, so the book goes into that Megan clearly favored Ivy. Ivy. Isn't that terrible? They're little girls. You don't do... Why is Megan acting like a child? Even children treat each other better than this. This is just disgusting behavior. You don't do this. What, Charlotte was four? 
It's ridiculous. That just shows what kind of awful person Megan is. So witnesses to this event include the Givenchy staff and people around Catherine. There was even, I think it was, was it Kirsty Ossoff, who was a friend of Camilla's, was there and goes on record discussing this, saying that Megan was just being horrible and rude. And when Kate would bring up her observations, Megan would emphatically reject them and again, just being over the top with the rudeness. So it caused Kate to burst into tears. Hmm. Goes directly against what nonsense Megan and Harry are spinning toward us, right? So people have been on record to say, no, 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 no. It was Kate that burst into tears. Kate tried to be the bigger person here and make amends. So the next day she brought flowers to Megan. What happens? These are the same flowers that Megan tries to spin to say, Catherine knew she messed up, so she brought me flowers. Not the actual truth, which was Catherine was trying to clear the air between them and be nice to her, you know, future sister-in-law and brought flowers, even though she wasn't the one. She was the one that ended up tears, but she still did the classy thing and brought Megan flowers. So now... Uh, when Catherine took her the flowers, she brought up the way that Megan speaks to her staff is unacceptable and that she's been, you know, completely rude to everybody. That's when reportedly Megan slammed the door in Catherine's face. Let that sink in. Yeah, me too. Can't stand them. Um, it's just terrible. She slammed the door in Catherine's face and threw the flowers in the bin. Nice person, huh? Really interested in making up and and really caring about your um, fiance's family just as much as she cared about his friends too, huh? Terrible people. Okay, so Megan went on to tell Oprah that the tears were hers and that uh, Kate was rude and that Kate brought flowers to apologize, even though, again, in the book it outlines why that is not the case. The complete opposite happened. I just... Like, do you think it even registers in Megan's head when she tells these tales and spins these lies like this that of what the actual truth is? Or is she such a sociopath? Do you think she believes it at this point that she she was the one wronged by all this? I'm just, is it for our benefit or do you think she actually believes it too? Let me know in the comments. Interestingly enough, it was around this time when the story got out of what a rude bitch she was that Megan started to spin the narrative and she became the victim in all of this, calling it a character assassination. Again, the balls on this woman. And it makes me love Catherine even more because (laughs) she had every right to freak out on Megan, but it sounds like in every situation she's taken the high road. And uh, I just would love to be on the fly. I'd love to be a friend of Catherine's and have her vent over tea what a horrible bitch Megan is. <laughs> Comments about you guys now saying revenge like that too. And I love it. I just want you to know I love it. I love your comments so much. I had somebody in the comments, thank you for this, saying that I sound like <laughs> Miss Piggy when I say it like that. And I kind of love that because I love the Muppets. Um, except for Beaker. I used to love Beaker, but now that I realize Prince Harry looks like Beaker, I'm not into Beaker anymore. But <laughs> Anyway, revenge. I do have to give a shout out to MC in the comments. You guys write me the best comments. MC pointed out, if William and Catherine were such fans of Megan's, why did they recoil from her hug when they first met? MC, that is such a good comment and such a smart observation. I wish I had noticed that too. So smart. So um, in case you're like, what? Remember, that was Harry's claim is that uh, Catherine and William were not welcoming of Megan. Remember, she's like, I'm just a down to earth girl in ripped jeans. And uh, and the claim is, is that William and Catherine recoiled from her hug upon first meeting. Maybe they didn't want you hugging them. That's their choice. It's not weird if you don't want somebody you're just meeting hugging you. But anyway, such a good point, MC. Thank you for that. 
Um, it just further shows that Harry makes no sense. And Harry and Meghan, all they speak in is platitudes and lies. Okay, let's get into revenge. So I don't have to keep saying it like that. So we pick up on chapter 22, humiliation. And you guys, I am feeling for Thomas Markle. That sucks. Thomas is feeling abandoned. He feels like the palace won't help. He felt isolated. No one was returning his calls. Um, so publicly his ridicule started to increase. That's where we left off. He was starting to show up in the tabloids. Megan then delivered quote, a wounding blow. Basically Thomas called up and told Harry that he really wanted to give a short speech at the wedding reception. Harry said it was not possible. Think about that for a second. These two, I'll have to find a new word for them. Um, oh, I had somebody recommend Woco Mono, and I love that for <laughs> for Megan Woco Mono. Okay, um, you guys are so clever in the comments. Thank you for that. I love reading those. They really give me a chuckle. But okay, where did I leave off? Um, yeah. So they didn't want her dad to say a few words at the wedding reception, but they did have James Corden host a dance competition. Did you know that? Because that's the thing that happened. So they'll let that Yahoo James Corden, I can't stand that guy, give, give a dance competition. But they don't want the father of the bride to say a short speech at the wedding. So my mind went to, do you think it was at that moment that she was like, no, nope, you're not coming? Or do you think she already had it planned before that? Let me know. All right, where else? The media continued to try to make Thomas look bad. So Samantha Markle got in touch with this guy, Jeff Reyna, or maybe he got in touch with her. I don't know. She worked it out with Jeff Reyna. And they decided that what needed to happen is Thomas needed to have photos to show that he was not reclusive like they were reporting. They wanted to show him in a better light. They wanted to put out some sort of narrative since she, you know, the only narrative coming out was from Megan. So, and for, I guess at that point from the um, tabloids and the, the press and stuff, God, don't get Harry talking about the press. That's all he can obsess about. Ugh, drives me crazy. Oh, P.S. I had the best responses. Thank you. Thank you. Cause I pointed out, if you didn't see yesterday's video, please go back and watch it. That's one of my favorites I ever did. But Harry is Buster Bluth from <laughs> Arrested Development. So many funny things. I was literally, it hit me in the middle of the recording. He has mommy issues. He's obsessed with seals. He talks about army and <laughs> none of it's real. <laughs> and then you guys pointed out, plus he likes older women. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> he is Buster. It's just fits. You guys are the best. Okay. So I don't even know where I was going with this. I just, uh, it just made me laugh. Okay. So, uh, Thomas was paid 1500 for these, an agreement to do some long distance candid photos. It was an agreement with that Jeff Reina guy. Plus he would receive 30% royalties on whatever Jeff Reina made on these photos. So the 27th of March, Thomas went out and had photos taken of himself looking at this book on Britain and he was sitting at Starbucks and then another one, he was at an internet cafe. I remember he was living at, in Mexico at the time. So he was looking up Harry and Meghan and then there was another one where he was measured by a, I'm using quotation marks. Think Joey from Friends. <laughs> so he was measured by a tailor for a wedding suit. Now the tailor is not a tailor. It turns out he was a party shop assistant and he was paid $15 to hold that tape measure. So according to Tom Bauer, don't come for me. This is what Tom Bauer says. Thomas was gullible and desperate. So Tom was struck. Thomas was struggling. And, you know, I know I, I've voiced my opinion in the past. I'm not going to go into it here. I have my, you know, I have a few issues with some of the choices made by the Markle clan, but, but don't come for me in the comments. I get it. I understand what you're tr telling me. I've read all the comments about, well, it's only been Megan's narrative. It's not fair to them. I agree. And, and none of it warrants cutting off your family the cold way she did. She's an awful person. We can all agree on that. Let's leave it there. Okay. So meanwhile, the press had been pretty favorable toward, I'm trying to think what is another good name. I'd, I'm going with Hank and Skank. Toward Hank and Skank, especially Skank. They were excited. She's joining the royal family. They kept calling her like a way to update the royal family, blah, blah, blah. How'd that work out? Um, there is this lady, Camilla Long, and she nailed it. She actually called 
at the time, she mapped it out that Meghan would have a big sit-down interview with Oprah. She predicted it would be after she and Harry divorced and once she's fled to America. Damn, she got that almost so right, right? I predict that there will be, she's probably right, after they divorce, which I do predict will happen sooner than later, uh, that Meghan will be sitting back down with Oprah to talk about, I don't know, how horrible Harry was to her and... They'll, they'll blame each other and I'll be here for it laughing all the, all the way. Um, <laughs> okay, so Meg was contacted by Oprah, funny enough. She, Oprah's people called Kensington Palace and they wanted to discuss her interviewing Megan before the wedding. Megan was told by palace officials, no, you have to reject that offer. Well, according to Mr. Bauer, who does extensive research, love that guy, he said Megan's response is, quote, she would wait until the time was right. So you tell me that she's not plotting every bit of this before. I mean, we all know this. She's been plotting since the beginning. Uh, why else would she keep such detailed records and quote unquote receipts? His re- I mean, Harry's receipts are written in crayon, but you know what I mean? <laughs> why would there be such documentation if you were planning to spend the rest of your life serving the family you married into, right? (laughs) Yeah, it wouldn't work like that. Okay, so journalists were starting to discuss and starting to notice Megan's lust for fame. And I say, my God, she was still hiding it back then somewhat. And then now here we are. Let's discuss their lust for fame. I would say that applies to both Hank and Skank equally. Megan got a whiff of reporters starting to say that, and that's when, according to Tom Bauer, don't come for me, that it's that it, the narrative was spun, victimhood, you know, the place where they're very comfortable being victims, they started to spin it as it was because of her race. Dun, dun, dun. So the quote from the book is, they would use the race card to rebut unfavorable news stories. Huh. Where have we seen this? Oh, yeah, everywhere. Even the sugars in the comments. That's their go-to. I'm like, nobody cares. That's not what everybody's pissed about. Way to totally miss the point. Honestly, you guys, when people say that, it just tells me they have no idea what they're talking about, and they've done zero research into this. They're just blindly following her. Wake up. Okay, we go into, it's late April. Jeff Rayner, that photographer guy, is shopping around Thomas Markle's photos. Jason Knopf, the palace guy, is alerted to the plan, and he then turns around and lets Megan know. Megan is pissed. What else is new? Um, so instead of kindly talking to her father about it, she's calling him up and being super pissy. So... She asked Thomas if he cooperated with pho- photographers, and he got nervous. He said no. Again, I have my own issues with the Markles. We don't need to go there. I don't. We're all on the same team. Don't be mad at me in the comments. But I do have to say there are things that he did that make me shake my head. And I feel like maybe I'm reading into this, but Tom Bauer was kind of saying the same thing. I've said it before. I'll say it again. The beauty of Tom Bauer. It's not always what he says. It's what he doesn't say. And it's the way he dances around things. And he, many times when discussing Thomas Markle, calls him gullible. So Thomas Markle sounds like maybe made some bad choices. It doesn't mean he should have been cut off. That is not what I'm saying. One does not equal the other. That's not at all it. I'm just, I just feel the need to always be truthful. And my truth is, yeah, I don't know about that side of the family. Okay. But... I still say Megan is the worst times 10. She just, she's worse than all of the rest of them combined. So there's that. Okay. Now I say that and now I'm going to sound like an ass, but I'm okay with it. Thomas, I feel terrible for him at this point because he is stressed to the max. He has, they discuss his, he had had a heart attack, I believe. And then he continually was in and out of the hospital during this time because I'm not a doctor. I don't know how it works, but it sounds like... I don't know if it's such a thing. Mini heart attacks, like pre-heart attack. He was having a lot of heart-related issues, right? So they discuss him having been treated for heart-related stuff. He was in and out of the hospital. He um, had gone to a hospital there where he lived in Mexico, but he didn't feel like he was receiving the the, the right care, so he discharged himself. 
he went to get seen in LA and while he was there, he left flowers for Doria for Mother's Day. Meanwhile, Reyna was working on selling these pictures and expected to earn about 100000 for the pictures of Thomas Markle. Thomas, at the same time, was texting with Megan about his excitement to walk her down the aisle. So the Sunday before the wedding, it was the 13th of May, the mail on Sunday exposed the story that Thomas was complicit with the photographer. And this is truly where I do feel sorry for Thomas because that's awful. It's the weekend before her wedding and I I can't stand Meghan Markle. It's not that I feel sorry for her. I feel sorry for Thomas because maybe he was, as Tom Bauer, not me, says, uh, confused and (laughs) he thought he was doing the right thing. You know, what other, like he didn't, he wasn't in control of his own narrative and that's a sucky place to be for lack of a better word. So He was just trying to do what he thought was right. The palace got embarrassed, a.k.a. Meghan got embarrassed. This is where Meghan and Harry got furious. So this is where I feel for Thomas. Thomas was in and out of the hospital. He was having chest pains. It sounds like he maybe had more than one heart attack around the time. And Meghan and Harry's focus was on the wedding, not Thomas and his health. And that sucks. That just shows more of them being all about themselves, right? Megan is blaming the media at this point. Tom Bauer asserts that it was her way of dealing with all this was to spin, you know, do a spin like Harry likes to do as well and blame the media. So she, her assertion was that the Mail Online knew the story, but they waited till just before the wedding so they could mess with it to release the story. And I'm like, of course you think the whole world revolves around you, Megan. <laughs> Do you think they'd sit on a story like this? I think they'd put it out as soon as they got it. Come on, make it make sense. Meanwhile, Thomas is distraught. He texts Megan that he was so sorry, and he offered at that point just not to come to the wedding. Harry called Thomas. He was calling Thomas, and it sounds like Harry was getting nastier and nastier with each phone call. Thomas offered to apologize and talk to the press and put out a formal apology, basically. And Harry's like, no, don't do that. Listen to me. Um, Speaking of, I actually have Prince Harry here with me, a.k.a. my husband, Jay. And (laughs) I have him on record. Tell us, Harry, what did you say to Thomas? Thomas, why are you in bed? Get out of bed. We have to talk. Quit being so lazy. Get out of bed. Why did you talk to the press? So again, Thomas was under men's stress. Jason Knopf, okay, so Harry had said, don't apologize. Jason Knopf from the palace called and said, he didn't say, go talk to TMZ, like <laughs> Thomas interpreted, but he did say maybe putting out an apology would be advisable. So this just confused Thomas. Again, not my words. This is according to Tom Bauer. He was confused. He didn't know what to do. He started to feel trapped. Meanwhile, he was stressed to the max. And unfortunately, he started having chest pains again. So he had arranged to go to a hospital in California at this point. He didn't like the care he was receiving where he lived. So he had a neighbor taking him to a hospital in California to check in. This is the place where he ended up getting heart surgery, but we'll get there. Meanwhile, (laughs) Harry and Meghan were not really being clear. They told him that there would be somebody there to collect him and take him to the airport. So this mysterious someone called him and says, I'll be there in two days to collect you. Be ready. And Thomas was like, sorry, got to go to the hospital having surgery. You know, Thomas thought it'd be a good idea in the meantime to speak to TMZ. He did confirm that he was working with Raina and apologize. Harry blew a gasket at this. Again, We have Harry here. He's going to let us know how he feels. I don't care what happened. I don't care what's going on. Don't talk to the press. He hung up on me. I guess I'll text him. Harry is freaking out over the press. What else is new? We read Spare. That's all he knows how to do is freak out over the press. So Harry and Megan decide that they're going to send security. But the weird thing that Thomas points out is that Harry and Megan sent security all right, but they sent it to Mexico. At this point, he was being prepped for surgery in California. So with, again, without saying it, to me, I'm reading into that Tom Bauer is telling us they're doing everything for the optics. Nothing is real. And that's exactly, that's where I feel for Thomas and the Markles in general is 
nothing is real. So they're doing it for the optics so that way they can come out, quote unquote, looking better. I love that it horrendously backfired, but they thought they'd be looking better. Talking about um, Harry and Meghan and um, nothing is real. Thomas had surgery on his heart and was advised by the doctors, nope, you should not fly. He texted Meghan and was wishing her the best. And then he got a text from Harry saying, if you had listened to me, this would never have happened. Can you believe that? Thomas is recovering from heart surgery. And again, I don't know why I'm surprised, but Harry and Meghan can only focus on themselves and that damn wedding. Who cares at that point? It's not about one day in your life. You know, it's about your family's health. It's just wild. I don't have to explain it to you guys. You guys know, but I'm just saying it's just wild at this point. Okay, so then Thomas, according to Tom Power, texted, if you really need me, I will come. TMZ reported at that point that Thomas would be going to the wedding. And then, you guys, it's heartbreaking because this is when Thomas receives his final text from Megan. I, I don't think he even said what it said, but he said that she signed off, love, Megan and Harry. And that was it. And he never heard from her again. That sucks. She had pleaded with him to come to London, even though he was laying in a hospital bed. I'm not laughing at the laying in a hospital bed. I'm just laughing at the delusion of these two. Like, you need to come to London. Our wedding is the most important thing ever. So then they started up on the, this doesn't sound like you. Do you know what I'm talking about? They talk about this. I was in the Oprah interview. Maybe it was the Netflix thing. I don't know. I've watched so much of their crap. But they didn't believe that it was Thomas texting. And Thomas is like, it's me. What are you talking about? So my theory is it's all about optics. That is a good story for them to spend. Like, we didn't even believe it was him talking to us anymore. We thought it was, you know, Samantha or somebody else had intercepted his phone, whatever. So that way they could make a clean break, not talk to him anymore and blame everybody else because that's what they like to do. So they're doing the, it doesn't sound like you. Thomas tried to call Megan on her wedding day and of course no answer there he he hasn't spoken to her that sucks palace meanwhile is had to scramble basically three days before they put out that the Thomas would not be able to come and they discussed it's because of his health issues several Markles went to London to try to do broadcasting stuff all right let's get into the wedding. Oh, yeah. And then Doria arrived 17th of May. Lots of talk. And I guess I didn't really pay attention to this the first time I read Re- Revenge. <laughs> How much Doria seemed to have some control. Or maybe they had... This is how I understand it. Doria and Megan have a weird mutual understanding that Doria gets control over some aspects, and yet Doria will play the game as long as Megan plays the game. Megan pays for her stuff, her life, you know, everything. And Doria will say what Megan says. She'll back up her lies, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, according to Tom Bauer, she was ordered not to say a word. So nice relationship, huh? Sounds totally normal and healthy. <laughs> All right, let's get into chapter 23, the wedding. This is what I've been dying to talk about. All right, so it's time for the wedding. Let's talk about it all. Can we talk about this dress? I had a lot of comments about the dress. I, okay, I can't stand Meghan Markle, that's clear. But that aside, I was hoping to like her dress. I really, at that point, I didn't know what kind of <laughs> awful whatever she was, but I was hoping to like her dress. But you guys, it was all wrong. The hair was wrong, the dress didn't fit quite right, and no wonder, because it sounds like she was messing with alterations every two minutes and redesigning the thing and recutting it. There was several mentions of that. She was recutting it. My personal belief is, you know, she does what some brides do where you lose weight before the wedding. The dress just didn't quite fit right. I just didn't think it flattered or fit. And honestly, like for a whatever royal wedding, I thought it was really boring. I understand that you have to have, you know, a certain amount of modesty and all this stuff, but I just thought add something to it. It just was too boring. That's my opinion. Let me know yours in the comments. I hate the hair. The hair was just a mess. It could have been really beautiful with the tiara and... Don't even get me started on that stupid veil. That stupid veil. <laughs> but it wasn't. They, She's just misfired everything. I will say I like the after dress. 
when they showed that the I'll put a picture of it up here I thought she looked pretty there and I like the aquamarine ring of Diana's but I would like to point out that the things I like are not Megan herself I like the dress and I like the ring so that's that <laughs> but I hate the wedding dress so there finally I got to say my piece on that let me know yours I do love Kate's dress I go back and look at I know I love Kate but it, that, that aside if I ignore who's in the dress I just look at it I do like the detail on it I thought it was a really nice cut it was very pretty very flattering she looked gorgeous she did her own makeup I think about that a lot I just I it's surprising it's just she looked gorgeous okay let's get into this wedding so Tom Bauer so astutely points out about weddings are made up of family and friends. This one defied that. It reflected Harry's uh, deliberate and detachment from his past. So he was cutting uncles, cousins, um, friends, whoever Megan wanted him to cut, he would cut out. And I'm not blaming all, all this on Megan. I'm saying Harry's an idiot too. He, I mean, we know, you know, I love to say it, that guy eats crayons. He seriously, he is... Buster Bluth. He just sits in the corner drinking juice boxes, right? When Megan wants something out of him, she probably plies him with juice boxes <laughs> and says, okay, we're going to cut these people. And he's like, okay, give me some more juice. Um, <laughs> so the quote was, guest deemed to be no use to Harry in the future were not invited. So this includes people he grew up with. They even talk about the Skippy and Skip. You know who I'm talking about? The guy who's wedding that Megan crashed, where we have all those horrible looking photos of her. That guy, that guy was cut from the guest list, probably because he said, what's wrong with that horrible bitch? Why did she crash my, crash my wedding? <laughs> so he was cut. Um, a lot of people were cut. And the only family, as we know, that Megan had there, the only family was Doria. Nobody else. And uh, Samantha astutely points out, Samantha Markle, that no one was invited, so that way she could protect her lies that she had told Harry. And I thought, okay, all right, she knows what she's talking about. So instead, she invited her girlfriends, her admirers, seriously, um, Hollywood agents, her lawyers, okay, publicity advisors, suits actors. So this is interesting. This I remember at the time of the wedding, they focused on the suits actors being there. But according to Tom Bauer, did you know the suits actors were not invited to the evening dinner? Can you imagine? They go all the way to London to be at this bitch's wedding. <laughs> and they're not even invited to the dinner. Nice, huh? Really nice people. Um, Okay, so some of the celebrities they named off being there, I mean, we saw the guest list, it was huge, but David and Victoria Beckham, James Corden, eh, no thank you, Elton John, George and Amal Clooney. So they did put a funny focus on George and Amal Clooney. Apparently, Thomas Markle points out that he knew George Clooney because he had lit, oh, I already forgot, it was like some... Some movie George had been in, he had lit for him. So he actually had met George Clooney and he felt like, he said, I know George better than my daughter does. And George is, you know, basically front row of the wedding. So <laughs> nice, huh? God, I love Tom Bauer so much. He nailed this part. He talks about Oprah being there and he calls her, quote, television queen of victimhood. And I say, yes. So well put. I didn't even, I mean, I didn't even think about it like that. And that is so well put. And that so fits in to where they've come, you know, since the wedding. Because, of course, the king and queen of victimhood. God, I don't even want to give them royal titles. The <laughs> dumb and dumber of victimhood, Harry and Meghan, um, ended up on Oprah's show. And P.S. guys, there are so many things flying around saying that Oprah... We'll have nothing to do with them anymore. And I kind of love that, right? I kind of love that. I, those idiots turn their back on everybody um, in both sides of the family. And they turn towards celebrity. I'm using quotations on that one. And what happens? Celebrities fickle, you know? Oprah's like, no, thank you. And I don't like Oprah, but I think that's hilarious. Um, <laughs> okay. Inviting. They invited Hollywood royalty. That's a quote from Tom Bauer. And they invited people that would firmly establish her roots in America. Tell me this is not pre-planned, right? Um, love me some Tom Bauer. I keep saying it, but I got to say it again because he pointed out that 10 million people watch their wedding on TV. Impressive, right? 
Until Tom points out that it was seventeen point six million to watch Catherine's wedding. Ah, oh, ah, oh, Chef's kiss. Mwah. Love it, love it. So yeah, seventeen point six watched Catherine's wedding to William. Ten million watched Harry and Meghan's. Aw. Uh, P.S. Twenty eight million watched Diana's. I thought that was interesting. All right, so Doria sat alone. People were surprised that she was not accompanied by a friend or an escort of some sort. Tom Bauer says that they people assume it was D- Doria's choice not to be accompanied, but that it was Megan's choice. Again, not shocking. She has to control everything, right? You know I love me some Kate, so I'm going to give some Catherine love at this moment. So here we go. I want to pet her. Um, I love her. Catherine being the amazing, wonderful, classy... I mean, regal woman, future queen that she is. She wore an Alexander McQueen that she had previously worn. And if you're like, Jen, why is that important? Well, I'll tell you. She did it on purpose because she's so smart. She knew that by wearing something she wore before, it would not take the focus off Megan. And so think about this. She'd been through these rows with Megan. Megan was treating her horribly. Kate had to have conversations with her about being a human toward her staff. And still, Catherine wrote, rose above it, and she did this. And I find that so classy and so elegant and so much, she's so much of a better person than I ever could be. I'd be a petty bitch. I'd be wearing, a, <laughs> I'd wear a white <laughs> dress and a veil to that wedding. <laughs> Uh, because I'm a petty bitch and it's fun. No, seriously though, I love Catherine and I love that classy move. So knowing that she knew wearing that outfit would put the attention on Megan where we thought at the time it <laughs> it belonged before we knew how horrible things were. Um, and I would also like to point out, so Catherine knew what to do, did the quote unquote right thing, if you will. You know what I mean? She, she did this to keep the focus on Megan and she was trying to signal, I'm not your rival. But also, it's the complete opposite of what Megan did. Meaning, Megan went to Eugenie's wedding and was still throwing a fit over that damn tiara that Eugenie got to wear that she didn't get to wear. So what did she do? She announced her pregnancy at Eugenie's wedding. Think about that. Nice, huh? Really nice person. So then in this book, Tom Bauer points out, just like we all love Catherine, he seems to love her too. And he put this line that I love so much, I had to write it down. It says, unlike Megan, Catherine will eventually become queen. Oh, love it. She's already queen in my eyes. I love her. Okay, so Megan arrived in the chapel in a Rolls Royce. This was a very deliberate move. It was the same one that carried Wallace Simpson. And uh, yeah, she knew what she was doing there. Megan's dress got caught in the door. I did not know this part. I thought this was amazing. Megan's ca- dress got caught. <laughs> it sounds like the people that were with her didn't overly want to help her because she was hideously rude the previous day. Now, I wish Tom Bauer had gone into detail here because I want to know every detail. What did she do? What did she say? How was she rude? I need to know these things, but he did not spill on this one. But he did point out she was hideously rude. So nobody was jumping to help her when she got caught in the door. I'm thinking, I wish the car had driven off. I'm not trying to hurt her, but I'm saying like, (laughs) tear the dress a little bit. That would have been hilarious because then whose fault would it be, right? (laughs) She wore this white Givenchy dress. Again, we talked about the dress. She made a point to walk herself down the aisle until the halfway point. Tom Bauer points out it was her performer moment. She was a proud performer feminist gesture. (laughs) Charles picked up halfway and walked her the rest of the way down the aisle. So at that point, Charles and Camilla thought that the union would enhance the royal family. Oh, and then Tom Bauer calls the crowd awfully self-adoring crowd. And I find that so perfect because again, it's it's these two to a T, self-adoring William was very tactful, even though he and Catherine had their doubts, he still praised Megan, the reception, and called her the sister he never had, and the best thing for has. Guys, when I hear that has thing, I know it's his nickname, but I just think, I hear it in Megan's voice saying, who's has? Like, she's pretending not to know every detail of everything and have this completely orchestrated. Ugh. So George Clooney, okay, he comes up again. Apparently... His tequila was served at the reception. Okay. 
Um, so it's a weird way to invite these people and kiss their asses at the same time. James Corden hosted a dance competition. They had a huge fireworks display, and they discussed the 32 million pound bill. Nice, huh? So from here we go, three days later, the papers were going nuts for Megan and focusing on her activism. So the royals have this rule where they have to stay out of politics. It's what keeps them going, not to get involved in things like that. But Meghan had different plans on that. <laughs> Tom Bauer says, duchesses don't campaign. Revenge! <laughs> Come on, admit it. How many of you are saying revenge like that now, right? Guys, this is future Jen here. And I'm just telling you, you have to look at the screen a lot on this one. I had so much fun putting this together. This is bad fashion edition. I knew there were some bad looks, but seeing it all together like this is very um, eye-opening. So take a look, have some laughs. Let's get into this. Thank you for joining me again. I am loving recapping this book. I hope you hear the happiness in my voice. I've been reading all your comments. You guys are amazing. Oh, speaking of comments, I heard you loud and clear. Apparently some drama happened at the wedding I didn't even know about, which was Megan swatting her what is it the footman I guess the guy that helps you in the car away at the wedding so guys I have a video of it so I thought at the end of this video let's take a deep dive into it and take a look what do you say stick around watch it with me okay so we are jumping back into revenge <laughs> and I can't help but say it that way let's just dive into revenge you guys are so great in the comments again I love reading them thank you for all the love and support I have so many new subscribers here if you're new Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. We were a great group, a lot of fun, and we love deep diving into all this. So let's jump in. Okay. So I left off revenge on chapter 23, discussing the wedding. I went deep into the wedding in the last episode. Check that out in case you missed it. So in this one, they just got back from their honeymoon. So they just breeze over the honeymoon, but you know, I'm a nosy, you know what? So I had to deep dive into it. Not much to to find that uh, there were reports of different locations, but best I could find it, they went to Seychelles. There were reports of different places. It looks like they went to Seychelles, which I, I only know the place because I've heard William and Catherine talk about going there before and it looks incredibly gorgeous. So apparently, supposedly that's where Harry and Meghan went. Now on that stupid Netflix documentary, they were very vague about it. They just said they went to the Mediterranean and I remember them saying some nonsense like they left in, what was it, waste removal trucks? Okay, like you couldn't... <laughs> You're telling me you don't have some blacked out windowed cars you guys could leave in? Come on, attention. <laughs> I'm sure you did leave in those and Megan was rolling down the window saying, Hey guys, it's me, Megan, the whole time, right? <laughs> she wanted her peeps to know where she was at, right? She wanted to make sure she had adoring fans. But guys, I was able to get Hank of Hank and Skank on to discuss his honeymoon. Tell us how it went. My brother's jealous of me. Whoa, weird detail to focus on on your honeymoon, but okay. I went on my honeymoon. My Taja oscillated wildly. I put on mommy's face cream. No, don't start this again. Do not tell us about your Taja and your mummy. Ew. I like to apply cream on myself and watch Real Housewives recaps. Oh my God, we're going to stop it there. Um... Thanks. Also, you can check out me, uh, Dr. Bad Vibes, on YouTube. Meanwhile, during this time, Oprah was texting Megan. Dun, dun, dun. So remember, in the last video, I talked about how Oprah was trying to get an interview with Megan before the wedding. And, of course, Megan is all about me gain, so she was all for it. But the palace was like, no, 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 not doing that. And Megan left some cryptic thing about when the time is right. I will sit with you. Some soap opera dramatic, I don't, suits, I don't know. <laughs> suits. When I say something dramatic, just yell suits at me, suits. <laughs> All right, so also during this time, Oprah visited Doria. Now I remember this. I don't know why I remember this, but I do remember this. Was there talk of her and Doria working together on a project or was it all to get the exclusive with Megan? I don't know. It sounds like they're all kissing each other's you know what's, if you ask me. But again, that seems to be how Harry and Meghan operate. 
Okay, so she remained in constant contact with people in California. Tom Bauer, again, have to show Tom Bauer some love. I love this book so much. He knows all the details on everything. He says that she stayed in contact with her publicist, her lawyer, and her business manager. Hmm. Setting the stage for something in the future? Interesting. Okay. But nothing's planned, you guys. Nothing's planned. Yeah, right. Okay. We jumped over to chapter 24, Tremors. So we pick up in June of 2018. The two happiest couple, hee hee hee, wink wink, nudge nudge, they are back from their honeymoon. And they're at Trooping the Color. Now, I know what you're thinking, because I'm thinking it too. I was like, is this the one? Is this my favorite Trooping the Color? Do you know what I'm talking about? You guys, my favorite, mo- <laughs> what, seriously, one of my favorite moments is, it's not this Trooping the Color. Um, it's the 2019 one. It's when Harry, Harold, told Megan to turn around twice on the balcony, and she got pissed. And it was so fun to watch. Oh, it's so fun. But no, this is the 2018 one. This is the year before that. And <laughs> Trouble in Paradise, I guess. But uh, she's wearing that, I don't know, blush colored outfit and uh, matching hat here. First time at the Buckingham balcony. Lots of forced smiles is what was noted. Um, apparently just before they came out to the balcony, there was a conversation about hierarchy. And she disliked being junior to Kate. Well, tough shit. I wouldn't even say you're second to Kate. I'd say you're two billionth to Kate. (laughs) Like, you don't even compare. (laughs) Um, She thought, Megan thought she should be treated as an equal. And Harry was egging this behavior on. Well, of course he was. He's the spare. I'm the spare. Gag me. I said that before. You guys got a kick out of it. Gag me with a spoon. I thought it was a Southern saying, but you guys corrected me and said it was a very old saying. Well, I'm saying it's an old Southern saying. (laughs) But gag me with a spoon. Seriously. Harry was egging this on because Harry's jealous of Willie. So now, I don't know. He's got an inferior complex. So now, I mean, obviously so does she. Okay, so then we have the infamous train trip with the Queen. Now, I found out during this trip that the Queen gave Megan a pair of earrings. Isn't that sweet? I love the Queen. Megan was doing her demure smile, and she was trying to show that she was bonding with the monarch. Meanwhile, aides were noting that Megan was behaving very detached, not following protocol. She was refusing to wear a hat when it was suggested. Things like that, you know, already showing signs of, yeah, I'm not into this. Obviously, we all knew that it happened quick, but to hear it in these terms, just back from your honeymoon, your brand new husband's family, <laughs> already you're being Duchess difficult, like, on this journey. It's it's just wild. It blows my mind. What did you think you were signing up for? Okay, so Tom Bauer goes on to say that Megan enjoyed the privileges, but she was reluctant to steep herself in British traditions. I'd say that's a very kind way of saying it. Nope, she just wanted to get paid for everything and <laughs> be able to spend and do as she chooses and not have to answer to anybody or be responsible for anything or (laughs) play the game at all. Nice, huh? So meanwhile, Megan's father, Thomas, we had a lot to discuss about him in the last episode. You guys had such great comments about that feeling similar to me where you really felt for Thomas. I feel the same way. I really felt for Thomas, especially the part where Charles walked Megan down the aisle and what that must have done to Thomas. And also you guys reminded me, I knew about the ongoing heart, heart attacks, heart surgery, heart problems. Um, but I forgot you guys remind me he had a stroke around the same time as well. That's just terrible. His last conversation with Megan was three days before the wedding and that was it. He still had not heard anything. He was trying to reestablish contact and she was not replying to texts. She was not answering phone calls. And then all of a sudden her phone went dead. So clearly she got, you know, Totally different setup. He was not in the loop of that. Thomas was giving an interview with, I believe it was ITV at the time. He started to speak out and become more vocal and explain that he's sad that he had to miss the wedding. And he gave an interview. Tom Bauer explains it. Basically, he was giving these interviews because of his pride. He didn't like the way he was being 
portrayed and he was being dismissed and portrayed in a negative light and he didn't like any of that he wanted to be able to speak up this is his way of doing that and you know being able to defend himself against some of the stuff he said in this interview he doesn't he didn't want his daughter and his son-in-law to be hurt by any of this he was actually hoping this would be a peace offering yeah that didn't turn out so great Okay, so then it's the Royal Ascot the next day. Megan's plan of cutting him off was not working. She thought it would silence him. He went on to do an interview in Mexico next and literally said he would not be silenced. He started speaking more to the interviewers, giving more interviews because it was becoming more important to him. Thomas Markle hired lawyers to get 50000 from that Rainer guy. Remember, he's the photographer that did the stage photographs. He had agreed to a set amount at the beginning and then a percentage of the back end. And it sounds like he wasn't paying up. So Thomas had to get lawyers on that. He was saying things like, I love you and I miss you and trying to get Megan to speak to him. And there was radio silence on her end. Having outbursts when talking to the British media, he said he said in an interview that his daughter is very controlling. What else is new? He calls out her fake smile that he could see. I believe it was at Royal Ascot. He was noticing, or maybe trooping the color, he was noticing that she seemed to have a forced smile. So things were tough all the way around and Megan was doing nothing to make it better. Radio silence on her end. Each rant from Thomas and Samantha um, was denting Meg's popularity. You know, I am surprised from that aspect that she didn't, I don't know, I don't, I'm thinking this out right now in real time. I'm surprised she didn't try to make fake amends on this um, just so her popularity might go, go back up. But then now that I hear myself, I realize, no, that's not, that's not what they do. Her and Harry always have to be the victims. So they made themselves the victims in this and blamed her family for every grievance. Hmm. Again, that sounds familiar, right? They just did that in spare with his family. So they did that originally with her family. So then we go to Wimbledon with Catherine in 2018. They discuss her. It was a mutual discomfort. And I remember this. I remember looking at these pictures and Catherine just has a natural charm and charisma that Maggie Poo just doesn't have. There's a discussion of Megan's unwillingness to be part of a team. Megan was all out for herself. That comes up quite a bit in this part of the book. They talk about that with the palace staff. It, It seemed to be that she thought they were there for her. They're at her beck and call. She's not part of a team that they support. They're hers. So we'll see that come up again. So there was started to be tension between Harry and William as well. So the Sussexes weren't wanting to stay at the same time with William and Kate at Balmoral. Let's take a little trip here. You know, I like to let my mind wander and let's play a little game. All right, leave me some comments about this. So you have the opportunity to stay at Balmoral. With the queen, yes. You have the chance to stay a week. You're staying either with Catherine and William or you're staying with Hank and Skank. Dumb and dumber, miserable and miserable. I don't know. (laughs) You name it. Can you imagine? I mean, obviously we know what you'd pick. But just, okay, let's daydream this. What would it be like? Tell me the differences. What's the week like with uh, William and Catherine versus your week with Hank and Skank. What's that like? (laughs) Can you imagine? All right, here's my thoughts. Of course, William and Catherine. I'm hanging out with them. I'm trying to talk shit about his brother. (laughs) I'm petting Catherine's hair, asking her for every product she's ever used, like, so I can take notes and go buy the exact same things. I'm, you know, having fun with the family. I'm (laughs) enjoying the heck out of them. All right, Hank and Skank. Can you imagine? I don't even know what you talk to those two about. Harry is drinking his juice and eating his crayons. Megan is staring at herself in a mirror saying, mirror, mirror on the wall. You know, (laughs) I just don't know what you have a conversation with those two about. Can you imagine? I would seriously be sidled up with the queen. Be like, can you believe these two? (laughs) Oh, the queen. I love her. So July 28th, uh, 2018, still Castle of May. Megan was there. This is where things get interesting. She is, again, not understanding that it's not all about her. 
I don't understand why a 40 something doesn't realize that. I guess she was 30 something at the time, but I don't above the age of seven, don't you realize that that the whole world doesn't revolve around you? I don't know. But Megan still thinks that it revolves around her and everything should be used to promote her. She was using this brief with the media to show how Charles was attached to her. Okay. Said that he admired her interest in history and furniture. So Charles is irritated about the Thomas situation. They don't understand why Megan can't get a hold of you know, can't get a handle on this and why she would not go see him. Why not go see him and make things right? The same thing we've all been saying, like, what the heck is your problem? But what Charles didn't understand is that Harry was withholding critical details about this. Harry wasn't telling Charles, and we find out later he wasn't telling the Queen either, the full truth about what was happening. They were claiming that she was afraid to phone because she suspected that the phone was compromised, that the phone was no longer in uh, Thomas's possession. Then they couldn't email because his email account was compromised. You guys, things are so tough for them. (laughs) Poor thing. They just wanted to do the right thing by her dad, but they couldn't because everything was compromised. Again, doesn't this sound like a middle schooler came up with this? whole idea. So I'm going to say Harry, I'm going to say it was her plan, but that Harry came up with the actual excuse because that is ridiculous. Again, love Tom Bauer. He even says Charles and the queen both got on a conference call, talked to her about it, and they could completely see through her inconsistencies. That's a very polite British way of saying she's full of shit. So (laughs) Megan gave more excuses about why she couldn't just fly over there. She didn't think she could just go to this place and show up and uh, just fix things. And they were again seeing her excuses for what they were and started to call them, quote, far-fetched. Doria may have been persuading Megan not to go back. Okay, so my courteous, talk me through this. You know, I am obsessed with all this stuff. This is the part where I guess I don't fully understand. Okay, so I know more is coming out about Dora and I can't wait. I'm here for it. You better believe I will be deep diving into it when it comes out. But so if Dora was not around when Megan was growing up, and and we've been through this, I know. They're using each other, Dora and Megan. So I get that part of it. Why does Dora have such a hatred for Thomas? You know, if he was truly there raising Megan, I just don't understand the vitriol. Help me understand that. What would be, uh, and I'm not doubting it, I'm just wondering, why did Doria dislike Thomas so much? I remember why they split. She was a, I don't know, free spirit and wanted to travel and then supposedly, you know, 10 years, wonder where she went, you know, (laughs) read between the lines there. But why the hatred between Thomas and Doria? Because Thomas even says he always invited her for Christmases when Megan was growing up and stuff and she would be around. So I I just don't, I just, that's the part I don't, I don't fully understand. You guys can explain it more eloquently than I can. So leave me comments. Let me know. Okay. So Megan, meanwhile, was mad. What else is new? She couldn't communicate with her admirers online. Yep. That's a real line from the book. Just let that sink in. All the stuff going on with her dad. All the stuff going on with your brand new husband's family, that's where her head's at. Megan was mad she couldn't communicate with her admirers. I'm saying admirers plural? Really? (laughs) I know there's like sugars, but I thought there was like four of them. I don't... (laughs) Admirers? So again, the queen and at the time, Prince Charles got on a conference call and were talking to Megan and Harry and urging her to go back to America and fix things. And Meg was rejecting that. She seemed to think that Jason Knopf and others were employed to promote her as an individual. How does she, I don't understand how somebody who supposedly, allegedly had what an, it had studied international relations and she doesn't understand how anything works. I have never heard of a more self-centered person. It just, it blows my mind. So Megan was fuming over Knopf's refusal and she wanted him to officially criticize Thomas Markle. Well, 
we know there, again, we didn't specialize in international relations, but it's easy to understand. We know that they, what is it, never complain, never explain? They just don't do that. They don't, they don't go to war over something like that. It's not their brand. They wouldn't do that, but Megan fails to understand mm, anything. So Megan felt, quote, isolated and stifled. I bet she did. Secretly, she took an initiative. You guys, I forgot about this part of the book. I found it very funny. Okay. Remember Gina Nelthorpe Cown? Remember her, that publicist that was a friend to Megan? And you know how it went. Uh, Megan used her until she didn't need her anymore and then dumped her. Okay. Well, Gina decided, no, 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 no. So she went and gave an unfavorable interview to the Mail on Sunday. It was a proposed article. It hadn't run yet, as far as I understand it. So she called Megan picky and discussed her instantly dismissing those who didn't share her vision. I would say she instantly dismisses those who can't elevate her vision or help her achieve her vision or she can't step on or use or walk all over. And then she goes on to explain the difficult time she was given in Edinburgh. Remember, that's the story I told you where she thought she was still on okay terms with Megan. She realized Megan had been weird in text, but she thought things were fine. She went to see them on their tour and Megan wouldn't even look at her. They, In fact, she had a, whatever, palace staff whoever, some staff member move Nelthorpe out of her line and get in Harry's line instead because she didn't even want to look at her. Nice, huh? Very grown up. Megan likes to move on. (laughs) That's the understatement of a century. So Megan was also asked to comment on this article and she was told she was not supposed to. So what did she do? She came up with a backhanded plan to handle it. She calls up her old pal, Jessica Moroni. I'm sorry, but I don't like Jessica Moroni. I don't know anything about her, but her face bothers me. And she was close friends with Megan. So that bothers me too. But (laughs) I do find it funny because she was ghosted eventually too. So how's that feel now, Jessica? Are you glad you wasted part of your life on this what super villain um but megan asked jessica to intervene so she did jessica called up this is the part i didn't understand she called up somebody relating to this article i believe they said a literary agent somebody that had the power to stop this article she talked to them for over two hours i'm thinking why didn't this person hang up i would not be able to deal with that But she decided to put pressure to try to change the article and change Nell Thorpe's statements. Can you imagine? What business is it of Jessica Moroni? Who is Jessica Moroni? Like, (laughs) that's ridiculous. So a complaint was made to the palace about Megan's conduct. And I love that. Can you imagine? God, if she had been mistreating the staff and they took down that complaint, I bet with glee they took it to the powers that be. (laughs) <laughs> but Knopf said he answered the call and said he would uh, ensure that it wouldn't happen again, but admitted that he was powerless. I'm sure that's a sucky place to be, and I'm sure it only added to the tension, um, which aligns with the bullying that he, you know, remember it was Knopf that brought up the bullying stuff that was going on behind the scenes with Megan that, of course, Hank and Skank deny Didn't they say they wrote like a 25 page response? If there's nothing there, why'd you have to write 25 pages? Just asking. Again, I have to go the crayon thing. I was just thinking, oh my God, 25 pages of Harry writing in crayon. She good. She didn't do it. (laughs) And then Megan just writes me, 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 me all over it. That's their response for 25 pages. I'm sure Megan probably printed out her IMDb list, whatever. It just says suits really big on it. That's my guess. So they were making missteps and misjudging the media again. I love this because full circle, think about this. Okay. As I'm recording this, it's come out that Oprah had a big old birthday party and invited everybody, but not Maggie. I'm making a fake sad face. (laughs) Don't you feel sorry for? I don't. Um, so I love that. She didn't invite Megan, her very good friend. Hmm. Interesting. 
How's that media stuff working out for you, Maggie Poo? Again, full circle, Megan misjudging the media. They are the villain until they need them and they use them and then they're the villain again. So I love, again, full circle. Here we are. He's making missteps on this tour. You know, I don't like Megan. I would cut her a little slack because, you know, it's her first tour. You know what? Let me rephrase that. I would cut most people some slack because it's your first tour. Of course, you're going to make missteps. I'm I'm a petty bitch, but I am also understanding that that happens. Where I don't understand is it sounds like she had a team of people trying to advise her of things and she's just not interested in listening. But then it sounds like she gets real mad when she doesn't listen and things go wrong. Now, the other interesting thing that I would like to spend about 14 hours discussing with you guys is the outfits. They go into four outfits on this part of the tour, whatever they're doing. Um, four outfits cost 28,000 pounds. Most of them were Givenchy. Givenchy. I'm very fancy, you guys. <laughs> you know what's funny? Side note, again, wander with me. I'm sitting here in my Target finest and <laughs> I realized, oh my God, I have my hair like Megan's from the wedding. I just like put it in a messy bun, right? And like strings are hanging down and I'm laughing thinking, mine looks more done than Megan's at her wedding. I had so many funny comments about the hair at the wedding. Thank you guys again for your comments. I love them. Okay. So they started to look into Maggie Poo's spending. Again, I need to know every detail. Unfortunately, we don't get into it too hard here, but I want to deep dive it. Believe me. Her last 15 outings, she wore Dior, Givenchy, Prada, Chanel. I don't see Target anywhere in there. No Old Navy? What the hell? Uh, <laughs> no, so she's wearing all these fancy brands. Huh, interesting. The same one she was having her people call up and ask for the Duchess discount. Tacky. Ugh. She never wore the same thing twice. She was looking, they were starting to notice her penchant for spending a whole bunch of money. And they were unfavorably comparing her to Catherine, whose annual clothes expenditure, again, this was 2018. Uh, Tom Bauer says her annual annual clothes expenditure was about $100,000. So her dad, it was July 2018, he says again that he's ready to speak to her. He learned that she's telling people lies about who paid for college. And again, I remember finding this out you know, a long time ago that there was discrepancy over that. And it is so interesting to look at this with fresh eyes coming off all the lies we have found out of spare to hear things like that now too. It's just, it. I don't know why I'm still surprised by all of this, but I am. It, it is m truly mind blowing how, how both, I want to keep calling them I know they're Hank and Skank, but I want to keep calling her Smegma. I don't mean to. It's like Hank and Smeg. Uh, <laughs> I know, that's really disturbing. Okay, Hank and Skank. We'll stick with that. Hank and Skank. Interesting just to know that Hank and Skank lie about everything. And then here we are looking through those eyes back at this stuff. Like they just have no relationship with the truth at all. So her father, Thomas, starts turning on the royal family. And he starts giving these, I don't know what it is, hellfire interviews about the royal family and how it's a dusty crown and it's an ancient institution stuck in its ways. I don't know what he was hoping to accomplish there. That's not good. Samantha is, meanwhile, still endorsing Thomas. She is saying things like, Megan, you should be ashamed of yourself. It's morally unconscionable to ignore Thomas and you don't just throw away family like a pair of shoes. And again, I say it's fun to read this through fresh eyes, knowing everything we know now, right? Because they both seem to take that attitude with just about everyone. And it sounds like maybe each other now because I keep hearing reports that those two are working on a separation. We'll see if it's true. I'm interested. I'm curious. And I've had people say, you don't want to see him divorce. Listen, I'm not wishing anything on anybody. It'll just be interesting to see how it goes. I'll be here with my popcorn. Okay. So during this time, Samantha's trying to support her dad um, and talking to the press. She decides to take a trip to Kensington Palace. She goes to London, takes the press with her 
and goes up to try to get in Kensington Palace. And they say, no, no, <laughs> no, go in. So nobody let her in, obviously. So she, when she was denied entry, she left a letter. No further word about this. But in the letter, supposedly she wrote, don't leave Thomas out to dry. So Tom starts to discuss how Megan was appearing to be guided by her, what's the word, jealousy of Catherine? You should be jealous of her. She starts to become more dismissive of others. I don't know how that's possible. (laughs) Sounds like she was already an awful bitch. And uh, it sounds like it was just getting worse. Again, they're just married. So things are already miserable for them. They're those people that are miserable. So they have to make everybody else miserable. Interesting. So Catherine was observing Megan's behavior and noticing that her behavior to the staff was unfortunately getting even worse. Now, remember, Catherine already spoke up about this. According to Tom Bauer, Catherine noted her behavior to be, quote, self-centered, manipulative, and demanding. Again, love me some Catherine. She nailed it. That is exactly, I mean, that's it. I think the exact same thing. I would say that's spot on. We're going to cut it here, but don't go yet. Let's watch this video. You guys had recommended that I watch these videos of Megan climbing out of the car and being rude on her wedding day. And I had no idea this existed. So let's take a look and see what's going on. Okay, so I found this footage. We're going to watch it. I thought, let's just watch it first. And then I'm going to see if I can slow it down and see if I can zoom in at all because it's kind of hard to tell what we're looking at. But let's just take a look. Wow, yeah, so that happened really fast. Let's see if we can slow it down and see if I can zoom in at all. Let's take a look. Okay, we're super zoomed in. Here we go. So she's getting out of the car. Cute little kid's getting out first. I heard she dropped Doria off earlier, so that way she wouldn't have to split attention at all. Here you go. He offers his hand. She pushes it away. Oh, my God. Okay, so now we're super zoomed. Now get ready. Because I cut out the little kids getting out. She's going to get out. She's going to slap his hand away. You can see it more clearly here. Here we go. Hand and don't need you anymore. Slap it away. My God, he even looks surprised. I don't watch sports, but I swear to God, this is the closest I'll ever be to watching sports. I'm watching instant replays. This is ridiculous. Yeah, she's clearly smacking his hand away. That's crazy. Here we go. Even closer. Hand. I need help here. My shoe's caught. I get it uncaught and bam. Hand slapped away. Not even making eye contact with him. He's surprised. Oh my god. Seriously, I could watch this all day. This is nuts. Hand. I need your help. My dress is stuck. He tries to help her. Hand pushed away. Won't even make eye contact. He's clearly stunned. What a bitch. Guys, I had so much fun with this one. I really enjoyed The montage of photographs in the background this time. We're talking revenge. (laughs) Oh, it still gives me such a giggle. And you guys are so great in the comments. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I had one of you say you're going to make that your ringtone. And that makes my heart so happy. That's hilarious. Okay. Today, we are getting into the dun-dun-dun bullying. She's bullying us with these horrible dresses. We get into the 2018 Australia trip. And it is a doozy. I remember hearing at the time, and again, I've read this book before, but I don't remember how bad it got. So we're going to dive into that. I'm excited. You guys are wonderful. Thank you for all the comments lately. I really enjoy reading them. You're cracking me up. I really, I appreciate every one of you. A lot of you reading along with me, and this series has become so much bigger than I planned, but I'm loving it. I'm really enjoying taking my time deep diving this stuff. We're on chapter 24, Tremors, which a lot of you reminded me is a Kevin Bacon movie from the 80s. But the plan remains to finish up this book and jump right into Cordia's next. We'll jump into the juicy parts. I'm very excited. And then hopefully Tom Barrow will get his 
the rest of his book out soon. I'm excited for that. We got lots to do. All right, Tremors. The staff complaints were through the roof. (laughs) So they were complaining and inflamed Meg's growing sense of victimhood. So I love, I mean, just again, think about this. So the staff is saying, hey, quit being a B word and she spins it as they're being mean to me. Can you imagine? It takes a special kind of villain to act like that. Then the word being markled hit the Urban Dictionary, which I find so funny because I've had a lot of you message me saying, have you seen this in the Urban Dictionary? Oh, yes, I have. So Megan demanded that the palace staff view the world from her perspective. That kind of sums up a lot of things, right? That was a direct quote from the book. That's what we've seen. It seems to be, we should all see it from her point of view. I will say her adamant followers seem to take the same (laughs) the same philosophy. Let's not do any research. Let's just go blindly and follow Megan. Okay. So she's getting empowered at this point. She believes that her achievements are noteworthy, that her standing was paramount, but yeah, not so much. She was demanding retaliation against critics who dare write anything bad about her. I, again, I'm laughing and you can hear the glee in my voice because I'm thinking, what the hell's going on now? She's got to be in her Montecito McMansion, like, pissed at the world because most people are talking about how awful these two are now. So, glad the world finally sees. Tom Bauer writes, something that came up in the book is a direct quote that says, she sincerely believed everyone had the right to create their own truth. What kind of nonsensical, it it seems to be she did believe that, except for if it disagreed with her truth. And I'm thinking that seems to be the same mantra (laughs) Harold Hankinskank adopted when writing Spare. So I definitely see a theme there. So from here, it sounds like things were just getting worse. She and Harry decided they need a break, you guys. All that bullying is hard work. Being horrible to people is really hard work. So they decided to take a private jet to George Clooney's house at Lake Cuomo. Must be nice. Okay, so the stuff with her father was escalating. He was continuing to give these interviews and where she wasn't speaking to him at all. And we found out in the last episode that she had changed her number. He decided to spin it, of course, like everything else says. Oh, she's the victim in all this, you guys. She decided that it was best to write him, even though the Queen and Charles had urged her to go meet up with her father. She declined that and decided to write him a letter. This is where we get that infamous letter. And can we spend about 14 hours talking about how wild her handwriting is? I'm somebody with pretty neat handwriting, and I do like a nice flourish when I write. But if you're writing like this, I mean, come on, I'm saying the obvious here, but she obviously meant for this letter to get out. We know this. But even more like, look at my beautiful penmanship, and oh, it's so... I don't I think what strikes me is it's so controlled and contrived, I think is the word I'm looking for. Now she's gone on to dispute this and cited doing calligraphy work as I don't, the reason for this, but I'm going to tell you, I did calligraphy as well. Writing a passionate letter to somebody, it's not, well, first of all, I wouldn't write him a letter. I'd give him a phone call, but <laughs> but it's it just doesn't look this controlled. It was all contrived, including starting with the word daddy, meant to pull at the heartstrings. But she was writing this letter, and she sent a draft of the letter to Jason Knopf. She was working with him at the time and she was sending drafts to him and telling him and everybody else this these tales that it was her father that was cooperating with the media and she was trying to get through to him. He wasn't listening. He wasn't picking up her phone call. So this was her last resort is writing a letter. So interesting that her complaint of her father was she blamed his co- cooperation with the media for destroying the relationship. And I say, what did you guys do with Spare? They're doing the same things that they're accusing Thomas of. So it's interesting how they downplay Thomas as not very smart until 
they need him to be smart and be media savvy all of a sudden and have this relationship with the press. And he's destroying, you know, he, saying that Thomas is destroying the relationship between him and Megan and choosing the press and stuff. And again, I say, what did you do to the royal family? Sounds familiar, right? So she accused her dad of fabricating stories. Okay. Manufacturing pain. Seen that from you guys. Being paranoid. Hello, Harry. Um, attacks. Hello, Harry and Megan. And lying. Hello, H Hank and Skank. That's all you guys know how to do. I just, that, I had to write that sentence down because it just struck me over the head with, Oh my God, this is exactly what they're doing. I mean, it makes you feel crazy, right? I know it's a definition of gaslighting, but I'm saying it makes you feel nuts because this is exactly what they're doing. They can't see that. They live in their own little world and everybody's mean to them. It's never the other way around. No wonder her, you know, dad and sister are chomping the bit to talk because they felt crazy this whole time and they were right about her. It's just uh, wild. She didn't suggest a reconciliation at all. She signed it. I'm asking nothing other than peace. And I wish the same for you. She asked Knopf to proofread and was still playing upon Knopf's sympathies. He's thinking that, you know, her father's doing all these things and basically ghosting her around the time of her wedding and making it about himself, not realizing that, no, it's the other way around. So I'd love to get to talk to Jason Knopf. I wish those NDAs would be li lifted. We're going to talk more about him with the bullying stuff, but I'm just saying, I bet that guy has some stories. So it seemed to further prove that she intended for this letter to be made public. She insisted that Knopf was proofreading it to help her combat whatever the public would be able to say about it, knowing, I mean, as we all know, that this letter would be public. Knopf liked her letter very much and was still feeling sympathy for her at this point. He suggested a few things um, that he would like to discuss with Samantha Cohen. Remember, that was his boss at the time. The lady that was sat between what Megan and the Queen in the background. He saw her a lot for a while. It was she was her, his superior. Well, Megan didn't want that. Of course not. She wanted him to proofread it, but she didn't want other people to get a hold of it because her lies might be found out. She was feeding stories of herself desperate to help him. That he stopped answering his phone and that she was desperate to talk to him. She had been calling. And, he would no longer pick up her call. Ugh, just awful. Again, interesting because it's literally what she was doing to him, but she spins it to have the victim narrative. Where have we heard this before? So she wrote this letter with the intention not to open the door for communication, but again, with the intention to leak it to the public, to play on people's sympathies, to win that victimhood once again. And I don't know. I my Again, he... Thomas, Tom Bauer didn't say this. I'm saying this. I feel like it's all pulling at the Diana stuff. Like, let's feel sorry for Megan. And I know, I, I know I can read your comments in my head. I know a lot of people have strong opinions about Diana. It's fine. I'm just saying, you know what I mean? Like the public saw Diana's vulnerability. Megan was trying to show some contrived version of vulnerability and the public saw as we did right through it and continue to do, right? So it ended up being a five-page handwritten letter. It was meant to pull at the heartstring with words like daddy, using terms like manipulation. And if he leaks this, it's on his conscience, you know? Conscience. I never say that right. She spun it as if she had heard of the heart attack through the tabloids. And she's a concerned daughter looking out for her father. So it was very calculated, obviously. Again, that seems to be her whole personality, very calculated. She was trying to rile up Thomas while making the whole wide world feel sorry for her. She discusses the global interviews that he was being paid to do and had the balls. I know people laugh when I say had the balls because I don't know what the... She had the tentacles to say that Thomas Markle was manufacturing a fictitious narrative. Ha, 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 ha. Isn't that what they've been doing this whole time? Talking about Harry and Meg. Sm Schmegan. 
<laughs> Smegma. Oh my God. Smeggy. Thomas got it, got the letter and thought it was an olive branch and obviously was devastated when he read the five pages of bullshit that she handed to him on a quote unquote pretty written letter. And then get this. During this time, the Grinfall fire happened and that is a devastating event. Terrible. But of course... Schmeg had to use the media and and Tom Bauer picks up on it being a very self-serving endeavor. The same time that this was going on, Harry decided to take it upon himself to have a talk with William and suggested that William be nicer to his wife. (laughs) I'm talking like that because, you know, I have to say it. Harry's eating crayons. What is he thinking? All the, you know, again... I love me some William and I love me some Catherine and all the restraint they showed during this, they need about 50 Buster Bluth army medals, right? Like the seals because (laughs) some stuffed seals because they are incredible people. They held it together and they didn't backhand that little ginger bitch when he said that (laughs) because I probably would have. So tensions were escalating and Dumb and Dumber, Harry and Meghan thought it would be a good idea to separate offices from the Cambridges. I bet William and Catherine were at home doing star jumps and high fives about that. Like, let's get rid of these assholes. That's great. Now we don't have to be tied to them anymore. So William talked about Meghan's behavior becoming increasingly more unacceptable. While Tom Bauer brings up During the first five months, she only did 26 engagements. And by engagements, he points out some of those were ascots and polo matches and theater and going to see the musical Hamilton. Those were engagements, you guys. Wow. They go into the amount of engagements that somebody like Princess Anne does and how often she does, they called it semi-anonymous charitable works. As a royal, I assume you can't be fully anonymous, but she's not doing it for the publicity of it all is what they're pointing out. What strikes me, Harry seems to go point by point and argue with things in his book Spare. So he's clearly read Revenge because he does address this and says basically that he builds up his and Megan's work while putting down everybody else's and says like it shouldn't be a competition for the most you know, whatever engagements attended. But I don't see Princess Anne out there bragging about the number of people she's helped and and charities she's supported, etc. But here we are with Harold Fraud and they will post that shit on Instagram, you know? Okay, so back to that cookbook Megan was working for. Tom Bauer says it was a gesture, not a landmark. William wondered if Megan was plotting a return to America. And I say, William... You are brilliant. Megan repeats her motto once again. Remember, we heard it before. It's not my job to coddle people. I just think of her stupid measured voice and archetypes and how it's all very put on like her handwriting. It's very, I'm turning into Countess Luanne by accident, but you know what I mean? Like it's very measured. It's very, nothing's real. There's no there there. There's no ums, uhs, you know, it's all very, it's all very annoying. It's the opposite of what you get with me, right? <laughs> Lots of ums and uhs and and make it make sense. <laughs> Lots of yelling into my mic. <laughs> okay, so William brings up to Harry more claims about Megan bullying the staff. Harry is outraged because Harry has no idea what's going on. He's only let out of his cage occasionally, but he's outraged And it was about this time that the accusations started to get in the public domain. Okay, let's get into this staff. So they mentioned this Katrina McKeeva. She had recently resigned. She was a member of Catherine's communications team, but she switched over to help Megan and was like, no, can't deal with this crap. I'm out. Omid Scobie, a.k.a. Megan's lapdog, decided, or he decided to poke his whatever into this situation his tentacles into his into this situation and insisted that McKeeva left on good terms sure Omid sure good boy of course that was disputed by anybody in the know which is not Omid Scobie Melissa Tubati she 
was, quote, traumatized by Meg's unreasonable behavior. Now, remember, I had talked about her before. She's the assistant who, when she couldn't meet Meg's exact demands, her unattainably precise demands, Megan would fly off the handle. She was the one that dealt with the red blanket gate, right? She quit. She's like, I'm out. I can't deal with this crap. It was just one after the other. So Knopf says that everybody was fleeing, everybody was stressed out, and this is when he started his file, and I'm so glad he did. Remember, this is still going on now. Megan was making people feel sick, shaking, and terrified. Now I'll address it because, you know, I tell the truth here. A lot of people have brought up, these are grown-ups. Why are they acting like this? I have the same question. I understand you can't tell your boss to fuck off, but I think... Here's my guess. Tom Bauer doesn't go into it, but I'm telling you. I've worked with horrible people, as I'm sure you have as well. Like to throw weight around, power around? I'm not sure. To try to make people feel small. And I'm I'm just guessing here, these are professional people. You know, we're working this job and not getting paid enough and, or who knows? I, I don't know. I'm just speculating here. Nobody could get paid enough to deal with this bullshit. And to see the behavior and to go from working with Catherine to working with this, again, I go back to Ursula going, you know, going to work for this Disney villain, Scar, (laughs) gotta be a tough transition. And it's, oh God, what a nightmare. Megan, like I said, made them feel sick. A lot of shaking going on. Remember, again, I swear Harry read this book and is trying to combat it in his book. In his book, he addressed, he said people were crying at their desks. But he spun it as they were upset because there was a rift between himself, Harry, and William. And I said at the time, that makes zero sense. People, your employees are not that invested in your brotherly relationship. That's not what it is. You guys are terrible people talking about Megan and Harry, making them feel awful. This is what's happening. These are the results of that. So Megan incorrectly assumed that her title allowed her to forget her manners. Suck on that, Maggie Poo. Those who refused to be sycophantic toward Megan were deemed unacceptable. Here we are. How's that working out, Meg? Sitting in your Montecito house. How are all these reviews going? (laughs) How's that feel? Hmm? Normally I would feel bad for you, but I really don't. After reading all this and knowing everything we know, I really, truly don't. Terrible people getting what they deserve. Harry, when speaking to Knopf, gave a vague apology to try to keep the peace. He then begged Knopf not to make the complaints official. Don't have them officially processed. What I think that means, because they discuss it later in the book, is... There is HR over at Clarence House, Charles's residence. He didn't want that to go there. William continued to urge Harry to talk to Megan about being a better human being. And, and I think, oh my God, what kind of example does Harry set? How is Harry able to urge anybody to be a better human being? He's a whiny, crybaby little bitch. Like, who's he gonna advise, right? But the damage at this point to the staff was done. Megan's narrative became William's staff was undermining her. See, nothing's ever their fault. It's that whole thing. They're never gonna learn because nothing's ever their fault. Must be nice to be so perfect, right? (laughs) I used uh, Joey's quotation marks on that. So they decided they needed to break from the Cambridges. Of course they did. So they were Report after report of unacceptable behavior was coming out to Knopf. The staff at this point deemed themselves the Sussex Survivor Club. I've definitely heard that. So Bauer explains here how Megan repeatedly used her power deliberately to hurt people. And I'd say that sounds pretty accurate. We've heard that a lot. Harry and Megan were about to leave for a tour of Australia. Ooh, we're going to get into this tour. I'm excited. Terrible fashions ahead, terrible, like, treatment stories ahead, and Megan gets to be a real petty bitch at this place. I'd forgotten about this. We're going to get into it. Okay. So Harry and his tiny todger decided to beg Knopf, please wait on the bullying stuff. We're about, we're about to go on vacation, or no, I guess it's a working, whatever. We're about to go to Australia. Megan thinks it's a vacation. We're about to go to Australia. I wish Jay was here to do the Prince Harry. Oh, no. 
please don't tell daddy. I want to go on my trip, and if if this gets reported, Megan will be angry, and she may hit me. At least he didn't talk about his todger that time, right? And his mom's face cream? So Harry later denied that he discussed any of this with Knopf or that he had interfered. Of course he denied it. Who's it going to benefit? Does it benefit Knopf to lie about this? No, it doesn't. It benefits Harry and Schmeg to lie about this. So who do I believe? Hmm, tough decision. P.S. Why does Harry always look so pissed and she always looks like... She was caught in a rainstorm <laughs> before any event. Why is her hair always like this? It's either like this or pulled really tight and severe. Tom Bauer brings up, it was at this point that they went to Eugenie's wedding and revealed their pregnancy. You know my problem with this. I've made it clear. I think that sucks and it's rude and you don't do that. I just, I, just, I mean, they're trying to steal her thunder. Now, we had come up with the theory, and I think it's a very credible one, and I still believe it, that it was Megan being a petty bitch because she didn't get the tiara she wanted, so she was going to throw a tantrum and get attention away from Eugenie any way she could. Tom Bauer kind of throws it out here, and again, I say it every time, it's what he doesn't say that's beautiful about this book. And the way I am interpreting it is, it may have also been a quote-unquote good time for them to throw out this reveal to try to distract from what was actually going on back at, you know, the palace with their staff. Okay, so they go on this tour of Australia. At first, things seem to be going well. The press is doing well with them. They're putting on the show, and they do an Invictus Games, and the couple was being loudly praised, and... Even Schmegma baked some banana bread. I, I just want to make a yeast joke there. Just insert what you will. Um, <laughs> but so she'd bake this banana bread. So they thought they could do no wrong. During this engagement, this tour, Megan had a staff of four women with her. You can imagine how well this went down. She announced to all of them that she needed people she trusted <laughs> and decided to invite Jessica and Ben Mulroney out, decided to fly them out to provide, quote, round-the-clock support. So she was boosted by Mulroney being there. Again, I can't stand that woman's face. Somebody had me laughing so hard in the comments um, that they seem to have gone to the same plastic surgeon. But uh, again, I think it's funny knowing that Schmegma ends up ghosting her as well. There are many reports that Megan was being abrasive with her staff, again, the four women that were with her, and this is when the alleged throwing tea incident happened. I wish I had more information. Come on, Cordius, help me out. Tom Bauer did not go into this. He just hinted, well, he just said that there was an alleged tea throwing incident and said that it was thrown into the air, but literally no other details were given. Help me out. What do you know? Tell me everything in the comments. What happened? How can I get video of this? <laughs> I'm going to need to see it. <laughs> I want to throw some tea at her. Okay, so every night, Harry would apparently search for snide comments on the internet. Again, I find this hilarious because, oh boy, do I have some memes to show you, Harry. <laughs> oh, God, just watch one of my TikToks. That'll give you some laughs. Inflamed by the slightest criticism, they would battle for retribution. I don't even know what that means. I just got that from the book. I would love to know what these two pea brains thought they could do in retaliation for people speaking huh, the truth. Uh, but any criticism would, it just wouldn't sit well with them. And, and I hope that continues on because you're in for a lot of sleepless nights. Megan wore all these ridiculous outfits. To me, they're some of the ugliest in the bunch. And that's saying something because she wears some ugly stuff. If you don't know what I'm talking about, watch yesterday's video. I'm pretty proud of that. Terrible outfits. I'm trying to keep the photos interesting. There's only so many photos because they only did like 70 something engagements. So I have to pull from those. And <laughs> yoink. So Harry at this point starts snapping at the media. He was doing, he was working with reporters. Again, this is a royal tour. He's snapping at the media. So Harry also continues to compare Megan and Diana. <laughs> I'm choking on. Just that whole idea. She wore Diana's earrings to an event there. And 
Tom Bauer so succinctly points out, Harry didn't understand that his mother didn't collect a court of followers. Diana's strength was in her vulnerability. The Sussexes were convinced that they had, or that she, I guess, had some of Diana's stardust. Again, Harry read this book because he directly says that in his book. Diana wasn't seeking money or fame. It came to her naturally. That is a quote by Tom Bauer. So yeah, I wouldn't say that's the case with Schmegma. Megan wanted to earn millions. She was coming up with these plans during this tour. She was trying to figure out, you know, how she can do this. It was during this tour that they also started to convince themselves, Harry and Megan, that William was jealous of them. Can you imagine? Okay, here's my theory on this. Harry's so dumb. He's dumb as a box of rocks. Schmegma knows this. So Skank is trying to convince Hank, ooh, your brother's jealous of you because she wants to create that divide. And I'm not saying Harry's innocent at all. I'm just saying he's so painfully stupid. He has no idea what's going on. And I don't know. I <laughs> This comes to mind. I was thinking, Schmegma saying, Harry, your brother's always been jealous of you. And, and I gave Harry an Al Bundy voice. Oh, sure, Meg. <laughs> and he's falling for it hook, line, and sinker, and it's working, and there's a divide. Imagine that. So it was during this time that they came up with Sussex Royal. They sure like to use that. They sure don't want to give up their titles, do they? I find that so funny. They want to distance themselves from everything. They want to throw every name of the book at the royal family, but they sure don't want to give up those titles. <laughs> They also wanted to replace Jason Kanoff. Of course they did. They think just getting a new person in, then that person would have no idea what they've been putting the staff through. So apparently during this time, Megan was in talks with her California team about reestablishing her place in California. It was that day during the Australian tour that, hmm, the Arch Foundation was registered. Dun, dun, dun. Obviously, we all knew that this was way planned out, but I didn't realize it was during this tour that they registered every variation of Arch Foundation. So they went to Fiji from here, and this is where shit got crazy. Got crazier. Crazier than this outfit. She gave this speech about how financial aid programs and scholarship and and her working were the way that she paid for college, knowing that word would get back to Thomas. So she's definitely poking him in the eye. Thomas speaks up and says, no, I paid every penny of her education. I even continued to pay on the loans when she was earning big money on suits. So he was furious at claims that she sent him money. Now, Tom Bauer gets interesting here because he explains that it does appear that Thomas paid for her student loans. Thomas does not talk about, apparently Megan did send him $20,000 at one point. That's neither here nor there to me in terms of she still shouldn't have cut him off it's awful situation. I'm not standing up for Megan. Megan sucks. We know this. Okay. Megan went to this. So she went to give this speech, right? After that, she ended up, she was scheduled to go to a Fiji market. These people had come out and they were very happy to see her. They were, they had lined up. They were waiting to see her. They were excited. She only stayed for, I believe it was eight minutes at this place. What happened? Well, I'll tell you because it's juicy. Remember, think back with me. Remember I was telling you about the UN women thing and how when they refused to give her some sort of promotion, she's like, that's it. I'm out of here. <laughs> Carmen, screw you guys. I'm going home. <laughs> so she's like, I'm out of here. I'm throwing a fit. So guess what? At this Fiji market, it, it turns out it was sponsored by UN women. There are all these women there wearing the shirts identifying as UN women. When Megan saw that, she's like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to ruin this event. Can't have the attention off me. Mm -mm. Even though it's an event for me. Got to be petty. So what does she do? She berates her staff, forces them to get her out of there, tells the palace that it was because of heat and crowds that she only stayed eight minutes at this scheduled stop. But it sounds like she acted like a real asshole. This was interesting. Tom Bauer points out by the time that they got back to their hotel after this event, 
the female protection officer that had been working with her decided to resign. She decided she'd make it back to Britain, but when they get back to Britain, she's out. Sounds familiar again. A lot of staff doing that. I wonder why. I'm sure it's a great job that's really happy. That's why everybody wants to leave it. So staff's unhappiness was being translated back to Knopf, back at the home office. He'd been working on, I guess, a memo, whatever, based on that file. He sent it on to William's private secretary. The guy's last name was Case. He'd been working with the brothers for a long time. Megan had bullied two and shattered the confidence of the third. And the fourth one was the protection officer who decided to resign. So imagine that. They all decided they couldn't handle her anymore. Sounds like she was a peach. That case guy went ahead and sent it on to the head of HR over at Clarence House. Now, whoever this person is, Samantha, apparently she helped bury it. And this part sucks because, you know, I love the royal family, but I do feel like they could have handled this better. I wish they would let those, I wish they'd let them out of their non-disclosures. I just want to know, is Samantha, I mean, she had to admit, was she in the pocket of Harry, I guess, or Schmegma? I don't know. Maybe it was an oversight. Who knows? But it got buried and that sucks. Nothing was done at that point. Harry says, so because Harry sees the opportunity since nothing was done, He jumped on that and gave it a spin and says, no, they left because of their own misconduct. Again, I ask you, who's, who would benefit from that? Them? The four people leaving? Are they all like, yay, let's, you know, we all got promotions. Let's be out of here. Or is it Harry and Megan that would benefit from that lie? Hmm. I wonder. Obviously, Harry and Megan. (laughs) You know what I'm doing. Play the game with me. (laughs) Guys, I'm going to leave it here because we're about to get into some questionable jewelry. It's happy couples edition. Every time you see them looking happy with each other, I don't know, scream. Where we're covering, say it with me now. You ready? Revenge. (laughs) Do you know that I've started doing that around my house? Like, hey, Jay, can you hand me the remote? (laughs) But thank you guys so much for being here. I'm thrilled. I am excited to get in this part of revenge. I thought, oh, well, now that we've kind of addressed the staff bullying, where are we going next? Ooh, I got like five pages of notes in front of me. Don't you worry, baby bears. We're going to feed you. I'm so excited. I can't wait to talk about it. So this, I don't even know what part I'm on now as far as video series, part 1 million, but I am loving deep diving this book. So much to talk about. So we pick up with these earrings. So these, okay, back up. They're still in Fiji. Remember they went through Australia. They started out as, well, rock stars-ish. You know what I mean? The, the It was going well. The media were liking them. They weren't being their total obnoxious that <laughs> they haven't revealed that side yet, right? They're still romantic. They're still on a honeymoon period. Oh, also, I got good intel from you guys. Several of you in the comments telling me that they were fighting real bad during this trip. I didn't know that. At this time, I really, what like when it was actually happening, I don't know. I had a young child and I wasn't really paying attention. I just seemed like, okay, cool. You know, like I don't, I didn't know anything about them, but now seeing it is fascinating. But yeah, I've had a couple of you tell me because you are my courtiers and you guys know everything and you keep me straight. So thank you for that. But you've been telling me that they had a horrific behind the scenes time on this, um, I don't know, leg of the trip. They were actually sleeping in separate bedrooms and yeah, things were going well. It's just, remember, this is right on the heels of them getting married. They haven't been married that long. And yes, the first year is tough. I get it. It's not that. I'm just saying like, they weren't two crazy 20 year olds. You know what I mean? (laughs) They're a little older. (laughs) They dated, well, I don't know what their true story is. They claim to have dated a year and a half. Who knows if that's true, but (laughs) I don't believe anything they say. They can't even make up their minds on how they met. So who knows what's true. But that aside that, I just find that all fascinating. Okay. So the interesting part of this is the earrings that Skank of Hank and Skank wore these very controversial earrings. Okay. So I'm jumping all around. They're in Fiji. They had left Australia for the next leg of the tour. They're in Fiji. Um, hello, must be nice. Would love to go to Fiji. They had this dinner thing at the Grand Pacific Hotel and Duchess Difficult decided, hey, I'm going to wear these big diamond earrings. Really good idea. And her staff was like, no, 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 not good. These are controversial. Know where your diamonds come from. She's like, I do what I want. Again, I turn her into Cartman because she's annoying. So, although I like Cartman, I don't like Megan. 
But she was like, no, I do what I want. These are my earrings. We good. You don't tell me what to do. I tell you what to do. I feel like I'm having a stroke. It's Friday. I've had coffee. I am very excited to be here. Let's go. You guys like it when I'm feisty, Jen, and I'm feisty today. So she's wearing these big diamonds and her staff was like, no, Megan, don't wear them. And she's like, I do what I want. So she did. And then was surprised when people were like, what the fuck are you wearing? What's going on with you? So her spokesman, yes, she had a spokesman. Can you imagine what that would be like? My God. Claims that they were borrowed earrings. Kind of danced around it, right? And said, you know, they were borrowed and didn't say who they were from. I'll tell you. I'll tell you who they were from. Muhammad of Saudi Arabia. I'm not even going to try to say his last name, but very controversial um, hard to talk about on YouTube. Let me dance around this a little bit. He did some not nice things. And by not nice, I mean real not nice things. Made sure that a journalist was taken out, if you get my drift, in Turkey three weeks earlier. And then was, uh, Megan was gifted these earrings at her wedding. So, you know, I don't know, being the greedy whore she is, she decided, I need these. It doesn't matter if they're, ter- you know, from a terrible person, whatever. Um, She's like, I need to wear them. You know, I said, he's be damned. Conscious be damned. I do what I want. So she did and was surprised when she got questioned on him, even though her people tried to tell her, no, 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 no. I need to advise her. Seriously, I feel like I would make a lot less mistakes. <laughs> Somebody was here to slap me on the back of the head and say, no, 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 no. I promise I'd listen, unlike Megan. <laughs> So three weeks earlier, yeah, that's when that stuff went down where he did the terrible things. It happened in Turkey. It Tom Bauer states that Megan was fully aware of what happened, still decided to wear them. And then dumbass, yep, Duchess dumbass, decide, oh, I like that, Duchess dumbass, decided, oh, well, I didn't cause enough controversy. I didn't get enough attention on me, so I need to wear these dumb things to Charles' 70th birthday party at Buckingham Palace. Real smart. She claimed to be unaware of why they're controversial. Me, 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 look at me. As long as she's getting attention, she doesn't give a fuck. All right. I gotta quit. November 1st. Okay. So they returned to London after this whirlwind. I say whirlwind. I don't know how long the tour was. Summer tour. Whatever. They went to Australia. They went to Fiji. Must be nice. They returned to London. They had convinced themselves that they were royal rock stars. Again, a quote from Tom Bauer. I'm sure of it. I feel like they probably feel like that. I feel like that. That's a lot of feelings. But I feel like... They probably still feel like that, you know, hello, no self-awareness. So they felt empowered that they could change the royal family. The egos on these two. There's, I know TikTok's annoying, but there is this TikTok song that always plays on a lot of video that just yells, what the fuck, over and over and over. And I feel like that song is playing in my head right now as I read my notes back. So these two yahoos have been married for six months. They think they're rock stars and they're ready to change Years and years of history. <laughs> Change it all. Spin it, you know, put it on his ear. Sure. Yeah. Omid Scobie. I'm going to start calling him Omid Scobie Doo because he is her lapdog. Omid Scobie Doo decided, hey, poor Megan. She's, I don't know. I don't even know what they're claiming victim wise at this point. Her dad's mean. Uh, we know he's not, but I'm saying like that was her narrative. Dad's mean. Reporters mean. Blech. Whatever was kiss he was sniffing around <laughs> that's what that's what dogs do right he was sniffing around he was trying to kiss her ass and saying that that Megan helped propel the monarchy to new heights i just want to i mean i just have a vision in my head of beautiful catherine rolling her eyes saying bitch please <laughs> i mean i'm way oversimplifying it i get it but let's say you've been at your job for how many years had catherine been there you, like i don't know 12 plus years before Megan. I'm just throwing out numbers. I don't want to Google. Um, she'd been there a long time before Megan even thought about this stuff, even hatched a plan for this stuff. And yet Megan's going to come in and in six months, change things, be the new face of whatever the, whatever she thought she was the face of at that given moment. She called herself the symbol of modern womanhood. Let that roll around and think about that. I'm sorry. I'm getting nauseous. So that's why I had to slow down my words there for a second. (laughs) All right. Scooby-Doo is reporting that the courtiers are having to rein in 
Harry and Meghan. So again, what happens? Victim narrative. So they're free spirits. They're going to change up the monarchy or the royal family or whatever the hell they're pretending they're going to change tradition. But those courtiers are reining them in. I can't wait to get to the book courtiers. Oh, and they get this. The balls. Ah, see, I got to find a new word for that too. They think that they're going to be bigger than Diana. Again, I'm not making this shit up. This was in the book. This is a direct quote. They think they're going to be bigger than Diana. Well, they think Megan's going to be bigger than Diana. It just shows a little at the level of narcissism. It just, I don't know why I am surprised anymore. I don't know why I'm sitting here shaking my head, but I am. And I'm rolling my eyes. I'm going to have eye strain. Somebody send help. Okay. Um, Harry asked for the queen's permission. When they got home, he went to talk to, to the queen. I love the queen so much. Okay. The queen. And he said, hey, granny. Actually, let's see what Harry said. Hello, granny. My free house is too small. Perhaps could I have a larger free house? So that's my husband, Jay, if you're new here. He does this all the time. He's Dr. Bad Vibes on YouTube here. But um, I think his Harry is becoming like, what's it? Um, oh, my God. Think with me. The Munsters. Herman Munster. He's like, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> I'm really dating myself on that one. But yeah, that's who he's starting to sound like to me. Okay. So where were we at? So yeah, Harry's like, hey, Granny, can I have my free house is too small. Can I have another free house? And she's like... Okay. So she gave him, I don't know if she gave it to him, but she said, all right, you and Maggie Pooh can go live at Frogmore Cottages. They were actually surprised by the request because Frogmore is about 25 miles outside of London. It's in Windsor. P.S. I've been by Frogmore and that whole area is gorgeous. I have a lot of UK peeps in my, uh, that watch and comment. So if you're in the UK, let me know your thoughts on that. I don't know where I'm going with that. I just love Windsor. In my head, I think I'd like to live in Windsor. Beautiful area, like breathtakingly beautiful, but I'm totally with Tom Bauer on this one. He was truly surprised that she would want to live 25 miles outside of London. That just does not sound like Megan, but obviously it's to get out from under the watchful eyes of <laughs> that sounds way more ominous. I don't even mean it like that. I mean, she wants to be able to do what she wants and not have anybody, you know, be able to catch her in the act. So the balls on again, I got to find a new word for that. Jay, what's another word for the balls on he said, I should say the plums on this guy. All right, we'll do that. The plums on this guy, the ginger plums, by the way, my hair is kind of reddish blonde, so no offense to my ginger people in the comments. It's not you. It's just this specific ginger that pisses me off. Um, the ginger plums on this guy. After asking Granny for another free house, which she kindly obliges, requested his own court. What do I mean? I'll tell you. He says that he wants his people, a group of people, separate from Buckingham Palace financed by the queen and the taxpayers money and he wanted to set up his own like I guess courtiers I don't I mean I guess that's what court means but you know what I mean like his own his own little group his own little sycophant fan club paid for by granny but running outside of the scope of Buckingham what the hell you think you're doing just shows like that he has nothing going on upstairs the queen says no 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 and by the way love the queen i know i said that but i'm saying it again especially right here she tells him you take your plums and you can have a small office here in buckingham but dream on on the rest of your your stuff they decided it was best they have a small office in buckingham under the queen's supervision love the queen so harry of course is mad at the world it starts to reignite his anger so he's having a searing anger and it's getting reignited. So we talked about this Melissa to body. So she was one of the staff that left. She was one of the ones that says she was reduced to tears. So Tom Bauer, it's, it's a little confusing. It sounds like I'm repeating myself. He just goes back over this because it's, it's just the stuff we talked about in the last video, you know, all those people that reduced to tears and, and quit and, were shaking and leaning over their desk, you know, everything that we read, that we learned about. That was more coming to light. We talked about in the last one how the memo got sent over to William's office and then it got forwarded to Charles's and then unfortunately it did get 
buried a little bit. So, but luckily the media was picking up on it. So they started to publish things about Tiara Gate and the queen. I love the queen. She questioned why the hell Maggie Poo, who's been married at least twice, I'm saying at least because allegedly there might have been another one, why somebody that had been married more than, you know, this was not her first marriage, why does she need a veil? Of course, Megan needs all eyes on her at all the time. Side note, that veil was really stupid. It was, I mean, it was just all an attention grabber veil. Think about what Camilla wore. She knew the deal. She knew what was going on. They did a very small... They actually did the ceremony, what, at the, I don't know what it's called in England, but I guess the justice, I don't know, I don't know. They did it somewhere like that, I don't know, the American equivalent of City Hall, basically, and then they had a party afterwards. I'm not belittling it, that's actually what it's called in the book. They refer to a party and a, as a reception, and um, it was just very modest, right? I mean, it's Harry's first marriage, so I'm not even saying they had to do that, I get it. They're young, they're good looking, you know, kind of, you know whatever. Um, so <laughs> we still liked them at that point. So I get it. They probably did want to have a big wedding. Fine. I don't even begrudge them that, but I agree the veil was stupid. That was a long way to say that. So there was reports coming out about the clash between Megan and Kate. And again, more people saying it was in fact that made, that Schmegma made our Catherine cry. And you know, that will not do. She was being very rude about staff and to staff, and that's what Kate had confronted her on, and they were clashing. Of course, that's not what the tears were about, but I'm saying that was part of the clash, and the press was reporting on it, and I am glad to hear it. So, of course, Harry hates the press. It's full circle, right? Meg was getting pissed because she felt like everything she requested was referred to Buckingham Palace. She didn't understand why first day on the job, she didn't just get to come in and, I don't know, bark orders at everybody and make everything weird. (laughs) Spin things around her agenda. She just didn't understand that she was meant to fit into the family, not the other way around. Harry, I don't, he has his head so far up his ass that he is... He's over in the corner eating crayons, blaming the media. Make that make sense, right? He's blaming the media and he's calling them media vultures and pouting, drinking his juice and eating his goldfish. Mm. (laughs) But he's pouting and it's ridiculous, right? Because if his wife wasn't being such a bitch and he would, and his, he's part of it too. He was apparently treating his staff like shit too. If they would be normal human beings and just have a modicum of respect then the press wouldn't be talking about this stuff because there'd be nothing to talk about. See, William and Kate. All right, so this is when Duchess Difficult came out, that name, and I love it, and I love that um, Samantha made a few dollars off of that. I actually find that very funny because you know it pissed Megan right off. They started to call the bad press character assassination because, again, hey, why change your terrible personality and try to make things right with people? Why, you know, why try to better yourself or, or learn from your mistake? No, 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 no. You just deny it altogether and <laughs> don't change a thing. Just blame everybody else. That seems to be the Sussex, the way the Sussex, I cannot say Sussexes, the way those two assholes operate. All right. So they emailed Omid Scoby to try to help. I don't know. The way I understood it is that they were not meant to deal directly with the press. Buckingham is, you know, Each of them have their people to handle this kind of thing. Well, what Megan wants, Megan gets. So she decided, nope, they will be, I will be, you know, dealing with this. So she decided to email Obed Scooby-Doo, say, don't pee on the carpet, Obed. But no, she decided to get him involved and say, she wanted him to help make the official denial that she had made. Kate cry. So her friends decide, okay, somehow it got announced that her friends would be cooperating with Omid Scooby-Doo to write a book. That book became Finding Freeman. (laughs) That book became Finding Freedom. And so here's my question to you. Do we do it? Did anybody read the book? I'm saying, do we do it like after courtiers? Maybe do you want to try to read it? I don't know if I can read that whole damn thing, but I hate Omid Scobie, but I don't know. Do we try? Has anybody read it? Leave me a comment. Let me know. Just a thought that popped in my head. We could totally make fun of them. I just don't know if I'm in it. 
Like, I can make two videos out of it. I don't know if I can make, like, 50, right? That would, I think I'd jump out my window. Um, okay, so they wanted this finding freedom to be wholly favorable favorable toward the Sussexes. It is so funny how Tom Bauer, Bauer writes. He even says, basically, without saying it, oh, it's be stupid. He will blindly follow the Sussexes. And Tom Bauer's right. He didn't actually say that, but he was basically saying it. And Tom Bauer's right. And look what happened. Um, she wanted the book to focus on... Guys, try to hold in your laughter for this one, seriously. She wanted the book to focus on her sacrifices that she made while being a duchess. Yep, I'll wait. Her sacrifices. <laughs> so Knopf is like, what the hell are you talking about? What are we doing? Now, Knopf was only getting part of the story. He didn't realize that Megan would be full on cooperating. We found this out later. But he thought that this Omid character, Scooby-Doo, would be writing a book. And when he got wind that Megan was trying to get her friends to be sources to the book, he was like, nah, you don't want to do that. You don't want to try to sway the book. Just let it happen, you know. And you can imagine how that worked out. Megan was pissed. I don't I gotta find a new word for pissed too. Her plums were pissed. Um, she had Harry's plums and was squeezing them like stress balls. Megan was mad. She disagreed. So you can imagine, well, we know what happens, but yeah, Megan won't take orders from anybody. Meg does what she wants. So then we got another interesting part from Tom Bauer. And P.S. I love your comments. You guys help fill in the gaps on this Doria stuff because I didn't fully understand it. And so many of you pointed out, it's not that Doria hates Thomas, like I read into the situation. It's more that she knew, she knew who was rich. She knew which side the bread was buttered on. So she followed the money trail and, you know, clung to um, old Smegma and Smegpoo. That's why she is down to be anti-Thomas because that's what Megan wanted. I just didn't see it like that. I wasn't sure. Wasn't sure what was happening there, but that makes so much sense. Thank you all for taking the time to write me and clear that up. Anyway, so Doria was stirring the pot behind the scenes. I had so many of you leave me comments letting me know that too. She was stirring up, I guess she was playing on Dum Dums. I'm including both uh, Hank and Skank and Dum Dums, but she was stirring up their fear of press during this time. Apparently they had a fear of press. Again, Interesting, because they sure eat up the press attention as long as it's deemed favorable to them. But if it's anything else, nope, not interested. The press are mean. The press are vultures. Bleh. Charles was nervous at this time, and he worried about his popularity. Of course, we all know what happened. Diana was... I get nervous talking about this stuff because I know a lot of you have strong feelings on both sides, so I'm just going to... I don't have a strong opinion on this. I, it's, it's easy to look with what 2020 vision now and say, okay, I get it. Charles was nervous because Diana was beloved. Don't fight me on this. I'm just saying, you know? And so he, I mean, it was shitty, right? What happened? And it's shitty how he and Camilla got together and it's shitty. They should have, he and Diana should have never got married. There you go. But he knew that because of everything that happened, his popularity was pretty low and Camilla's was even worse. You talk about somebody having to deal with some bad press. There you go. Make it shmega. Shmeggy? Wow, I'm already confusing myself. Smegma. Sh she should seriously take notes. I'm having tongue twisters. Let me try this again. She should seriously take notes from Camilla on this, right? Because it took years of being unfavorable. And every time the anniversary of Diana rolled around, their popularity would drop right back down. But see, again, Megan could have used this opportunity to get to know her father-in-law, her mother-in-law. Um, and did she do that? I, I, I know, not mother-in-law, but you know what I mean. Father-in-law and his wife, um, future queen consort, whatever. But did she do that? No, she made it all about herself. And I keep thinking about that too. I'm cutting myself off. I'm so, I'm very caffeinated. She could have done that with Catherine. She had an excellent reference material right there. And I'm talking about Catherine. Beautiful, smart, dealt with it all, right? Handled it all like a champ. You could not ask for somebody better, a better teacher, instructor on how to deal with, you know, just getting used to 
married life, marrying a royal, all this stuff. But nope, nope, didn't care to get to know that either. It was all about Megan. So she married a dimwit, and this is what happened. Let's see. They brought up uh, the popularity of those two being a concern, knowing that eventually, you know, as we know, Charles would become king. So during this time, William and Charles were working on their bond. They had suffered, you know, friction because of the whole situation with Diana and then Camilla and, you know. Um, but William understood, he understood the obligations and he understood his role and William and Catherine were living in Norfolk and they decided to make the move to London and Charles gave them more royal duties. And in the meantime, Harry decided to do the complete opposite. They just left it at that. Tom Bauer said, Harry went in another direction. So then we go into chapter 25. This was hilarious, you guys. So Smegma, the first story in this chapter is about Smeggy and being obsessed with Michelle Obama. I don't get political here, so I'm going to leave my opinions out of it. But I'm going to just say in general, Michelle Obama, she is not. Megan had tickets to go see her, thinking that they'd be best of friends. She went backstage to, quote, meet her hero. Megan had even arranged that they all meet up for dinner at George Clooney's London house. Or, sorry, it's in Windsor. His Windsor. House outside of Windsor. And I'm like, wow, he has a house outside of Windsor too? Oh, my dream. Anybody wants to buy me a house outside of Windsor, you'll be my new BFF. You can come over for tea. It'll be great. Um, I, unlike Harold, I will not complain about a free house near Windsor. My God, the spoiled brats. Okay, so Dutch is difficult. Uh, it didn't go well when she met Michelle Obama. It did not go well at all. She didn't appreciate how much the Obamas admired the queen. So Megan's attitude alarmed Michelle. This is a direct quote in the book, and I love that. And I'd love to know what it was that alarmed her specifically. Uh, like, what was she acting like at that event? You know, like Michelle had been doing it for a long time. So I'm sure Maggie Poo was doing that. New, maybe like a, a version of Nouveau Riche thing, right? But Nouveau Royalty thing. Who knows? But she was acting an ass. And it sounds like Michelle wasn't having it and gave some uh, advice to Megan in the public. That was basically take some time. Don't be in a hurry. And she says she tried to soften a little bit and said, like me, Megan probably never dreamt she would have a life like this. And I laugh and say, oh, how wrong you were. She dreamt up this thing, this whole plan, all concocted, ready to go. Okay, so she <laughs> she got snubbed. And yeah, that added to Megma's downward spiral. Whatever was going on with her was adding to it. Friends were seeing a change in Meg. This is according to the book I have I take issue with the part about friends. I just can't believe Megan had any friends left at this point. But the juicy part, I love this, Tom Bauer goes into, she was, quote, cooped up and not caught. Okay, so let's play this game called How Will She Be the Victim? Well, I'll tell you. She says she was upset because no one treated her as a royal. When I talk like that, by the way, I'm doing my pouty baby voice. So my pouty baby voice. No one treated her as a royal. Mm. Seriously. It, does that not sound like a three-year-old having a, you know, a play date with a friend? She's not sharing her toys. Eh. Um, she also complained that no staff was there to prepare her meals. And I'm like, bitch, what are you doing all day? Tom goes into how she basically refused to do what is it called? Royal engagements, whatever those things, you know, the things that the royals do, she wasn't doing them. She only did like, uh, six engagements. Sorry. It was eight. It was six plus trooping the color and a remembrance day thing. That was it. Not much else. I remember she gave, when she was talking to Oprah, she talked about, I just had all this time I watched. Was it little mermaid? I, who cares? Um, <laughs> she watched, some Disney movie and was comparing herself. Yeah, it was a little mermaid. Cause just talking about she's comparing herself to it. And I'm like, Oh God, that's even funnier. Cause I was calling her Ursula in the last episode. I didn't even think about that till just now, but you wouldn't have time to sit on your couch and watch little mermaid. If you'd taken this role seriously, if you'd tried to get along with people, if you tried to go to engagements like they'd asked you to do, if you tried 
And you know what? I don't even fully fault her for not taking on a hundred things right when, you know, right the first six months of their marriage i remember william and Catherine kind of did that didn't they go to wales and kind of i mean they did engagements but they they had a little more privacy so i i don't fault dumb and dumber for that i don't i actually understand the logic there but i do fault her for being a whiny little bitch and saying i don't have anybody treating me like a royal well act like a royal you ass um but also this nobody would cook for me and i'm thinking Here's an idea. If you really don't want to cook, maybe don't buy $10 million or whatever it was worth of dresses that you only wear once and then chuck, you know, and maybe spend some of your money because you guys aren't poor. (laughs) Spend some of your money and I don't know, take a cooking class or, or fucking pick up food or have a delivery service, something. I know Uber Eats wasn't a thing, but do Uber Eats, whatever, Deliveroo. <laughs> See, I know British stuff. <laughs> where's my Where's my visa? I want to be in Brit. Okay, I want to be in England. Can we trade me? I don't want to marry Harry, but can we, can we trade me for her? That'd be wonderful. <laughs> she can stay here. I'll bring my family over. We'll We'll do royal engagements. It'll be wonderful. <sighs> one can dream. I just think about this too. Sorry, I'm going to go off on a side tangent. I find it very wonderful. It makes my heart happy to know that because of these idiots who abandoned this amazing country, these amazing people, and I'm not even pandering. I truly love England with all my heart. I'm drawn to it. I love it so much. And it's because of talking about these ass clowns that I get to go to coronation. And that means the whole wide world to me And I just want to tell them, suck on that. Because I'll be there with bells on, thrilled, enjoying every second of it. Because of, I don't know, calling out these two ass clowns, right? (laughs) And I'm thrilled to be doing it. And I can't thank you guys enough. I just love the irony there. I truly do. Okay, where do we leave off? So, yeah, people weren't cooking for whatever. I feel really bad for her. You're a grown-up. Figure it out. Go get food. She talks about going to the grocery store. Send, you know... I understand that she may not be able to go, but send somebody. Eat. There's, there's, you're not going to starve. You're going to be okay. I say all this to say her reluctance to take on the traditional royal duties was making it all worse. She was spiraling. And while normally when I hear something like that, I'm like, oh God, that sucks. You know, I hope, I hope they figure out what it is that makes them happy. But again, we're not dealing with normal people and the regular how I would treat a regular person does not apply here because they did not treat anybody like a normal human being. Stories were coming out in the paper, including details of her when she got married to Trevor and they handed out him substances (laughs) rhymes with smarismuana to their guests. And so she was mad because all these details were coming out. What else is new? So she's living in this little cottage. Not, I, I'm not even going to downplay it. She's living in a beautiful free home, but she was spiraling. And she decided to get out and go to this. It was a fashion awards. It was British fashion designers. I don't know. I don't know fashion, obviously. Target doesn't have fashion awards, so I don't know about it. But uh, she decided to go to this fashion awards show and decided to wear Givenchy because that seems to be all she can wear. She decided to wear Givenchy because why wouldn't you wear a non-English fashion designer, non-British fashion designer, when you're going to a British fashion award, right? Make it make sense. Just not at all thoughtful, just obviously shows she just can't think about anything or anyone but herself. Meanwhile, Thomas is giving, he's decided to give another interview. Her letter did not stop him from speaking up. This is the first time he's speaking up since getting her letter. We also find out, and I forgot about this part, Thomas sent a letter to Doria and he said that he's fed up with it. He's fed up with her lies and he's fed up with uh, talking about Megan, where she, j- j- this was on the heels of her saying that she paid for college and he's fed up with it. He's like, no, that's not what happened. He appealed to Megan on TV. He begged her to call him. And of course, you know, we know how this goes. And this pushed Megan and Harry into a deeper spiral and they decided, hey, I know, I know how to fix this. Let's contact Omid Scooby-Doo. 
Let's do this book, Finding Freedom. So remember we left off with the Finding Freedom. <laughs> I never said that right. Finding Freedom with Omid Scobie. You know, I cannot stand that guy. We pick up with him. He's working on this, I don't know, fiction work. <laughs> and Megan was concerned with her personal styling. You guys, I did not make that sentence up. Let's think about that. Megan was concerned with her personal styling. That was like one of the first sentences that I had when I picked up this part of the book and I could not stop laughing. I had to write it down and I had to laugh about that because as you know, we've been laughing about her awful, awful styling, right? Like that's the ongoing joke. However much money she spent, it, she looks terrible. So Knopf was there. He was still believing he was doing the right thing, helping her. She was not telling him the full story about what was going on from everything from like, with the media to the events with her dad, everything was being spun. We know this now of Megan. Knopf did not realize it at the time. He thought he was helping. He was emphasizing the importance of being able to say hand on heart. He did not cooperate in this book. You know why I'm kind of giddy and laughing about this. Uh-huh. We'll get to it. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> We'll get to it. So yeah, that comes back to bite them all on the A because we know what happens. All right, Scobie. Funny enough, Scobie was known for selling tabloid stories. So think about that. These two who pretend to hate the media, and I say pretend because they sure do like the work with the media to get attention. They just don't like bad stories about themselves. Let's call a spade a spade. Scobie was known for telling tabloid stories, and yet they sure wanted to pair up with him, make him their lapdog slash mouthpiece, and... <laughs> They seem to be okay with him for some reason because, again, make it make sense. Oh, make it make sense. I'm so glad I said that. You guys, I have Make It Make Sense merch. Check that out as well. Uh, the Recollections May Vary merch has been incredible. Now we have Make It Make Sense because it's one of my favorite things to say. I say it about this and I say it about and just like that because none of it makes any sense. Okay. December 10th, Knopf sent Megan a list of questions to prep Scobie because Knopf was going to meet with him and Scobie had some questions, so Knopf forwarded them on. Knopf reminds her of her need for deniability, like, Meg, back off, Schmeg, back off. <laughs> you don't need to be involved in this. We got this. Harry played along and says, oh, yes, yes, of course, yes. That's my Harry. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I'm eating crayons. Of course. We don't want to be involved, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. He's saying that with his fingers crossed behind his back, right? Like, you can't believe anything either of them say. You guys, we're going to get into some big inconsistencies coming up, so hold on to that. Three years earlier in Elle magazine, Megan said her parents, quote, crafted a world around her to make her feel like she wasn't different, but that she was special. Isn't this a different story? Didn't she talk about feeling different? I mean, it's just, sure, sure, Megan, sure. <laughs> it's just whatever story suits them at the time, that's what they go with. And I think that's honestly one of the reasons I'm so fascinated by these two is because the story changes constantly. And it just, it makes them look absolutely insane. And it's kind of fun to watch. And it's fun to point out the inconsistencies because they put them on record. And they don't, they just don't care. <laughs> oh. Okay. She also discussed her parents as a tight-knit group. Hmm. Again, dying to see the Tom Bauer update to see what the real story is there. Let's see. Oh, so for the book, she was spinning this tale that she was supporting her father. But he'd spoken out and said, no, 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 no. She didn't support me. Tom Bauer, again, love him. He always brings the truth. He explains, well, she did give him 20K, uh, but she was not supporting her father. Okay. Then Megan tries to interject these Again, this is drafted for the book. This is something she wrote out, that the Tierra Gate wasn't what they said. You ended up leaving out the whole Tierra Gate, and we know it went down. We've discussed it at length, but she left that out about the Emerald Tiara, because why tell the truth when you can just spin it however you want? That seems to be her and Harry's motto and the, the words they live by. So she says that the queen said they all suited her. Of course she's saying that. Megan's world, we all just live in it. Oh, she also felt the need to emphasize, this has come up twice, that Jessica Mulroney was not her stylist. Now I can't stand Jessica Mulroney, we know this, but 
I'm just laughing, thinking she thinks she's taking a dig at Jessica Mulroney. And I say, have we seen how Maggie Poo dresses? That's a compliment. You're actually doing Jessica a favor by separating her from your horrible fashion choices. According to the book, Harry wanted to, quote, tell everyone what she's been through the last two years. What the hell is Harry's problem? All I can think, again, this is me thinking is, I mean, he's stunted at the age of 12 when he lost his mom, and he's never aged beyond that. That's why he writes like a 12-year-old and thinks like a 12-year-old and can't stop talking about his todger and his mummy and his face cream. Ah, you get it. So the idea is that this book that would eventually become Finding Freedom, it would be targeted toward Americans. Hmm, what's that you say? Hmm, setting seeds for when you move to America? What? She had it planned all along? No, I'm shocked. I hope you can hear the sarcasm in my voice. She wanted it to, quote, correct the record. My take on this is, well, she wanted to hide the truth, right? Correct the record. It's been on record, things she said before, and now she wants to spin that. So, of course, she wants to, quote, correct the record. Knopf said it would be a celebration for her. Again, he was still under the misassumption that she was being treated so poorly and still believing anything that comes out of their mouths. According to the book, Knopf bent over backwards to help Megan. The palace was in overdrive to protect Megan as well. Hmm, looky there. Everything they said didn't happen, right? Is that nobody protected them and they were on their own and nobody would help them because they were too busy helping William. These two, they can't even keep their lies straight. She and Harry would deny that they ever collaborated with authors or that they put in their version of events by means of the book. So straight up lying, again, what else is new? That's all these two know how to do. Okay, they went on to do a signed legal statement saying that neither she nor Harry wished to be involved in any way with the book and that Knopf didn't contact Megan on any matters regarding the book. Again, Bauer bringing all the evidence. That is not the case. All right, Cordias, let's get into this because this is how I understand it. I'm sure things will be not exactly right. You can correct me in the comments. It's cool. Let's get into it. The problem here is they're like, no, 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 no. We didn't have anything to do with finding freedom. That's I don't, that could be Harold or Fraud's voice, you pick. And they even put out this legal statement saying, no, we didn't do it. No, we would never. They had Knopf fooled uh, and everybody at the palace thinking, okay, they didn't actually get involved in this finding freedom. So they could actually put out a statement saying, no, 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 no. And I think it was in July, they'd put out a statement. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex were not interviewed. It did not contribute to finding freedom. So that was in July, right? Well, Obviously, we know that's not the case. They did get involved. Because she was involved with the high court and she was suing over the letter to her father, she ended up having to admit that, oh yeah, she was involved. Her excuse was that she was uh, worried that her father's narrative about her, including that she had abandoned, allegedly abandoned him, might be included in the book. Therefore, she presented her own version of events to a source to pass along so the true position could be communicated to the authors to prevent any further misrepresentation. So it's all a big lying game with these two, as we know. They can deny, deny until somebody points out the truth. It's just whatever suits them at the time, that's what they're going to say. So that was the side trip to explain exactly what was going on throughout this process. They spin it one way. No, we would never, we would not be involved in this. This isn't our book. We didn't write it. And then Bauer explains, oh, yes, they did. They were absolutely involved. Megan was emailing 31 points, you know, talking points to Scobie and answering a million questions and absolutely everything to involved with finding freedom. So, yeah, again, no relationship with the truth Let's just say whatever we want because it suits them. So this is Christmas 2018. Behind the scenes, the Fab Four, no longer, we know this. But in public, they were trying to put on a happy face. They were doing the Sandringham thing. They were headed to Mary Magdalene Church. And 
Megan was given big old fake smiles trying to neutralize stories about the bridesmaids. This is what I mean by whatever the truth, whatever version of the truth that suits them is what <laughs> they expect everybody to abide by. So it's interesting that she was expecting everyone else to play along. So that way she could maybe neutralize the story about the bridesmaids right? She was trying to get everybody to play along and smile. And she and Harry sure do love to spin stories about everybody else. But when it comes to them, they expect everybody to play along and smile and back up her side of the story. Just saying. <laughs> We've called it all along. Not even surprised anymore, but it's just interesting. It's an interesting psychological study. I'll say that. So meanwhile, Thomas Markle is spending Christmas alone. He ended up giving an interview to a British tabloid and said that his daughter was, quote, just a pretty girl married to a former army officer who would never be king. Oh, if those two hate negative press, you know that had to grind their gears, right? <laughs> he goes on to say that Megan could have prevented this just by giving him a call. So I would like to point out Every step of the way, they always make the worst decision possible. We all said the same thing. Just give him a call. You know, the, the queen and Charles were encouraging her, just go fly out there and meet with the guy. But I'm saying, okay, maybe that wasn't, I don't know, maybe that wasn't dual. Who, who can get in the mind of any of these people? But um, whatever, just pick up the phone. It's easy. I don't know what her, I, I don't know what her problem is. Everything's her problem. Okay, so then they go on to explain that Harry and Meghan spent 2.65 million pounds to rebuild Frogmore, but she was still dissatisfied. Now, I love this part of the book because this contractor that was working with them to do the renovation went on record and he said that she was constantly changing her demands. Where have we heard that before? Hello, wedding dress. She seemed to be playing a part of a duchess and was expecting, she thought she was expected to behave like Marie Antoinette. So that's what she was doing. Let them eat cake, right? Oh, I love that movie, by the way. Kirsten Dunst, great movie. So the other thing that they discuss is during this renovation, she had the best of everything, of course, from contractors to just everybody helping with the renovation. She even had the curator from Buckingham Palace that was responsible for the Queen's paintings to come over and help, but she was still mad because she didn't. She said he didn't exp produce the results she expected. Nice, huh? So the stories of this got out. The media was getting involved knowing that she was behaving like this behind the scenes. And of course... Bad stories in the media. Megan's not happy. <laughs> Megan wants, Megan gets. She, like I say, she was unhappy. She felt like the building was good enough for staff, but not the Duchess. I'm rolling my eyes so hard once again. Sounds good enough for me. It all came to a head when she started to complain about the $4.5 million William and Catherine had spent renovating Kensington Palace apartment. Okay, I would like to spend about 14 hours talking about this. In what world does she think that she should get the exact same things that William and Catherine had? They've been together a lot longer, married a lot longer. They are the future king and queen. So, of course, they'll be entertaining more people at their home. I just think it's ridiculous and shows the lack of awareness from these two that they would expect the exact same renovations, the exact same treatment. Maybe if you hadn't spent an obscene amount on your wedding, maybe there'd be some leftover to renovate your free house, your entitled twits. So it confirmed to Megan that no one appreciated her. I hope she still realizes this, and that her power and influence that she thought she got by being married to Harry was all an illusion. I find that very funny. So the prize you thought you were going to get versus the prize you actually got. Okay. <laughs> I would say he also got the short end of the stick as well. You two would deserve each other. Okay. So then this weird stuff comes up. And I do remember hearing about this in the news. Again, my UK people can fill me in on this one. There was a focus on they didn't like that a public park was not too far from their house. And so... They fought and fought and 
felt like they needed a, quote, much-needed ring of steel, but they got it ordered that the public not approach Megan or her dogs in Windsor Park. This did not win them popular approval. And what happened with that? Well, Megan found somebody else to blame. Get this. So that's why I pointed out that Knopf was bending over backwards, trying to help her with this book, Finding Freedom. Well, she started to blame Knopf right? Because he was being nice to her. Why not? She started to blame Knopf and saying that he was the reason that these negative stories were coming out because he wasn't doing anything to stop them. It was at this point that they, I'm going to go a direct quote from Tom Bauer. They began to accuse tabloids of arousing racism. Okay, let that sink in. These two that in real time just caught huge backlash because They were accusing the royal family of the same thing, and yet they backtracked on that. So it's funny how they throw that card around when it suits them, right? Megan says that she was undefended from the media. However, previously, she gave an interview with the BBC that she ignored the media. So interesting that she knows all these media stories when she ignores the media, right? She even had said something like she wouldn't read it and that she didn't get on Facebook. I don't whatever she said. I have that that clip, but she had said that she ignored it. She doesn't read any of that stuff. Obviously, that's not true. She adores the fame, quote unquote. Megan and Harry began to call themselves persecuted insiders. That made me gag. So this is when the I didn't want to be alive anymore stuff came out. And I have to... It's just, it's hard to discuss on YouTube, so think with me here. You know what I'm talking about. That stuff that she claims started to come out, okay? She started to discuss this with Harry. Tom doesn't say this. I'm saying this because we all know this. We all have brains. Of course she's going to say this to Harry because the famous stories of Diana are out. We know about the stuff that Diana was dealing with, especially while pregnant. And so, of course, she's going to say this stuff because she knows it gets her attention and and it bugs the piss out of Harry, and that seems to be one of her favorite pastimes. She gets the crayon eater all riled up, right? Then she's, <laughs> and she gets the attention she craves, win-win. So she's telling Harry this, and he goes, of course, into a tailspin. Megan, at this point, said her reasoning was, quote, critical media. So again, think with me here. Didn't these two just put out a big stupid book called Spare where they were critical of their entire family, both sides, and criticize every grievance they've ever had since they were fetuses. And yet she's saying the criticism is the reason that she was having these thoughts. So, you know, whatever truth that suits them, that's their truth, right? Their truth. There is no such thing as their truth. There is the truth or not. It's Amber Heard all over again, I swear to God. They keep contradicting themselves. What else is new? All right, January 2019. That's when that evening at the Royal Albert Hall happened. We know with the sparkly dress and the intense hand-holding Cirque du Soleil performance. Tom Bauer does not come out and say that it just didn't appear to be true, anything that they were saying. So I'll say it did not appear to myself (laughs) that it did. It just, it just doesn't. None of it makes sense. Okay. Harry is talking about how unfair it would be on him that another woman in his life could potentially be gone. Listen, I want to put a little asterisk here and say I am not talking light about the subject matter. If that was truly happening, clearly worst thing I've ever heard. You know, that's terrible. What I'm pointing out is that it's interesting that these stories now, how they've changed, how... It's an interesting coincidence, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, with the Diana of it all. That's the point I want to, po- that's the point I'm trying to make. It just, it just doesn't make sense, right? Make it make sense. Especially since Harry had previously talked about therapy, and now this is where that stuff where therapy wasn't an option for Megan started to come up. What? Why wouldn't it be an option for Megan? They even get into that... They, sub- they talked to a senior, quote, unnamed royal, which, by the way, they've never named who this person sub- th- who this person was. They're just, again, that unknown source that they love to use when it suits them. They tried to, s- they sought help with this person, 
but was denied saying that it would not be good for the institution. So you're telling me some high up fictitious royal said, no, no, Harry, it would not be good for the institution. We'd rather your wife truly suffer and deal with mental health. You know what I mean? If it was truly that dire, why wouldn't Harry step in and take her right then to a place where she could get help or find somebody, bring somebody in to get her help? It just, again, the truth is irrelevant to these two, right? Tom Bauer points out that there are conflicting accounts about this fact, about, you know, her having these feelings and the things that they've said since from the time of day that she was having these feelings to the number of days she dealt with this. And they never gave an explanation as to why Megan sought help from an unnamed palace official. Why not go to the top? Okay, Harry never identified which member of the family it was who, quote, neglected his wife. Tom Bauer points out, sure seems like that Harry's the one neglecting his wife. Harry goes on to point out again, because it's his favorite go-to thing, how much Meghan, quote, gave up to marry into the royal family, and she's become an unprotected target. Well, I would say the unprotection started at home. Let's say I believed Megan. I don't. Let's say I did on this. I would say, Harry, what the hell are you doing? If somebody that close to you is in that much trouble, why aren't you stepping up? Cry, baby. Um, okay. So then we go on to the next chapter. Chapter 26, Exposure. Megan is talking to her American girlfriends. Why is this important? Because she's spinning something different to them than what's actually happened. Do you see the theme here? It's the same thing she was doing Knopf. She spins a story of whatever suits her at the time. She gets people riled up to be on her side and then steps away. Like, like, oh yeah, that never happened. <laughs> so she's speaking to them and her California friends are revving her up to fight back with the media. Scobie's book has been delayed. She's pissed about that. She wants her words out there, even though, guys, she claims that she didn't have words in the book, right? <laughs> oh God, the inconsistencies are fun. And she was urgent to try to find another platform. She wanted to be able to... They, they wanted to put out Megan's plight. They wanted to describe it. And one of the friends in this group that wanted to, quote unquote, help her is a friend of Dan Wakeford's. And he was over People Magazine at the time. So he agreed. The deal is one of the key ingredients in this article would have to be the letter to her father, Thomas. She's denied using it as a calculated media strategy. The rest of us who have heads can see... <laughs> brains and eyes can see that's exactly what happened. She knew by giving her friends this letter, they would be able to not only outline it, but actually like quote from it, right? It was on the eve of this publication of the five friends when she went and did her banana trick. Not the one you think I'm talking about, not the yacht stuff, but the banana trick where she thought she was so clever drawing on bananas. Well, when the media criticized her on that, guess what? You ready to be shocked? I know. I know. Hold on. She called them racist. <laughs> nice, huh? Same thing when she visited, uh, it was, I believe, Manchester University. And she pointed out that there were too many white males for her liking. Yep, that's a direct quote in the book. She was breaching the rule of impartiality. She was getting full of herself. She was trying to spin anything she possibly could in her way. And she had done all of, like, I think it was two visits, those two visits, and some theater outings. And that was it for seven weeks. And so Tom Bauer points out that Anne at this time had done 25 full days during the same amount of time. So how about that? T Harry, again, in his book Spare, hates it when people compare their work to somebody like Princess Anne, who works nonstop around the clock and is often... Um, like we talked about in the last episode, she's often semi-anonymous. So they're all about the public recognition. And, and to her, it's being a celebrity is more important than anything such as royal duties. You guys, that is where I'm leaving it. Ugh. Oh, God. I don't even know why I let them frustrate me so much. But I do. It's interesting. It's a great book. I still love it. I just like... It's just so interesting to read this after reading Spare and knowing all the lies that have come out. It's just completely fascinating to me. And again, I ask the question, who could possibly blindly follow these two? I don't know. They're out there. Mm -hmm.